Now we are going to go on to cardiovascular. So cardiovascular is going to be about 20% of your exam. So it's really important that you are familiar with your cardiovascular. Honestly, I will be honest with you guys. I had trouble cardio with cardio for that exam. It was my first EOR. So I did very poorly on the cardio portion. So let's go through this. Angina pectoris. This is going to be chest pain with exertion. What we need to know is that all type of chest pain or angina is due to coronary artery disease. What means is that there's not enough oxygen for the body. So oxygen demand is greater than supply, usually due to vasoclusions because there is some type of atherosclerotic plaque, like coronary artery disease. And what we need to know is that there's different types, right? So we have our stable and our unstable angina. We also have a prince middle angina. So stable angina is going to be chest pain with exertion where it's relieved with rest. So the patient is, for example, walking and then they get chest pain, they sit down and it gets a lot better. They tend to have a crescendo decrescendo pain nature and it tends to last between one to two minutes versus your unstable chest pain or angina this is chest pain with exertion, and no matter if they rest and sit down, it's still there. This is unstable angina. It's not really with rest, and the chest pain is new or worse than the previous episodes, and it tends to last longer between 15 to 30 minutes. This includes uh, your STEMIs, your NSTEMIs, and then your non-myocardial infarctions. So how I think about it in regards to I mean, all types of angina are bad, right? The patient can be asymptomatic, they can have coronary artery disease, and they can have really bad coronary artery disease, and they don't even know that they have angina. And then you start moving up, right? And then you have your stable angina. So stable angina is going to be, like we said, chest pain, but the patient only has chest pain when they exert themselves. If they sit down, they feel better. That's why it's called stable, right? And then we move up to unstable. Unstable angina, that's a little bit more serious. So with unstable angina, that patient has chest pain no matter if they exert themselves or even when they're sitting, it's still constant. And then we have that NSTEMI, right? This patient is still having chest pain. Um, it's called NSTEMI because you do an EKG and they do not have ST elevations. That's why it's called NSTEMI. And then the severe one, which is your myocardial infarction, this is going to be a STEMI, ST elevated myocardial infarction. So that's how you kind of differentiate each ones. Also on all of these, right, you want to run your opponents to make sure that the patient is not having a cardiac infarction or a heart attack. So on your STEMIs, the patient's going to have an ST elevation on your EKG, and they're going to have a troponin that's going to be increased. And if we go one step down to our end STEMIs, this patient's going to have the chest pain, right? Um, very similar to a patient having myocardial infarction when regards to symptoms that they're going to have that chest pain that radiates to the back, that radiates to their jaw, to their shoulder, etc. And then you do an EKG, but the patient does not have ST elevations. And then uh, when you do a troponin, the troponin is positive, it's high. And that's how you differentiate between both of these is that a STEMI, you're going to have an EKG that has an ST elevation, positive troponins, chest pain, and STEMI, you go one step down. Uh, they're going to have a non-ST elevated on your EKG, but their troponins are still going to be positive, right? And with these patients, they're also going to have those chest pain symptoms. If we go one step down to your unstable angina, these patients are going to have negative troponins, and then their EKGs are not, are not going to show ST elevations. They're both going to be negative, but they're still going to have that chest pain, okay? And that's how I differentiate it. So your STEMI is going to be 100% occlusion of the vessel that is supplying the heart, right? Because that's what's happening. If we think about the pathophysiology, we have vessels that supply blood to our organs. And we have several vessels that go to our heart that supply our heart, right? We have our um, circumflex arteries. We have our uh, left coronary artery, our right coronary artery, etc. So if we have any type of occlusion on any of those arteries, it's going to stop blood flow to the heart, right? To that portion. It can affect the inferior portion of the heart. It can affect the superior portion, depending on what vessel is affected with uh, these patients. So in a myocardial infarction, what happens is that you have 100% occlusion of the vessel. So a STEMI is 100% occlusion of that vessel. 
and NSTEMI is about 90% occlusion of that vessel. So that's why it's really important that we treat these patients aggressively with your statins, with your aspirin, with your ACE inhibitors, with your beta blockers, because these patients can progress to get a STEMI. I mean, they're already there at a 90% occlusion of the vessel, and they're very prone to becoming to that full 100% to getting a full um, heart attack. So that's how I differentiate between all of these. Now, where what is Prince Metal's angina? Prince metal angina is chest pain that occurs in cycles. It, it can occur during rest, during coronary vasospasms, so like the vessels is just vasospasming. And on these patients, what you're going to see is transient ST elevations. You're going to see ST elevations everywhere. Usually when we think about a uh, ST elevation myocardial infarction, so a STEMI or heart attack, we usually look at the leads and it'll tell you which vessel is occluded. So if we see two, three, and ABF, right, we see those leads, we're like, okay, you know what? The inferior portion of the heart is affected. Well, with Prince Metal Angina, they're just going to be everywhere. It's going to be very random. And usually it's very commonly found on the question. It'll tell you that it's a very young woman. She's like 30 years old. And she like feels like she's having like a heart attack. She has that Levine sign, Levine sign, where they put their, their fist over their chest and like, I'm having chest pain. And they present to you, and it's a healthy woman that doesn't smoke. She doesn't have a family history of heart attacks, and she doesn't have a history of coronary heart disease, and she's presenting with this chest pain. And then you do an EKG, and you see all these like ST elevations everywhere, and you're like, okay, this patient does not have a heart, a heart attack. They have Prince Middle Angina. And it's because you're having that vasospasms of the vessels. So what are some of the risk factors of angina pectoris? You have modifiable ones like cholesterol. Um, you want to make sure that if the patient has an increased LDL, that we're treating that LDL with our statins. Our statins are like the best medications to lower our LDL levels. So our resuvastatin or a torvastatin with these patients. If the patient smokes, educate them on uh, quitting smoking. If they're hypertensive, sometimes we have patients that are have hypertension and it's uncontrolled. They're not complying with their medications or they just don't follow up with their doctor. So making sure that we control their hypertension is really, really important. Another thing that we need to control with these patients is also their diabetics. For diabetics, heart attacks are like the number one cause of death in these patients because what happens with diabetics, right? is that most of these patients have neuropathies everywhere, aside from the common peripheral neuropathies that involves their lower extremities. They're, remember when we think about a patient coming in that they don't feel sensation in their lower extremities. Um, for example, I have several patients that will go to the hospital, they're diabetics. They'll be at a fire just with their buddies, like at a fire camp, and they are just placing their leg over the fire and they don't even know that their foot's on fire until they start smelling the fleshing burn and they're like, okay, my foot's on fire because these patients do not have sensation to this part. And this is the same thing for heart attacks. Since these patients do not have a sensation, sometimes they'll have a heart attack and they won't present like your typical patient that's presenting with your chest pain. So sometimes with these patients, they die from a chest pain because they had no symptoms, they didn't feel it or anything because of that same thing, because of the neuropathy. So it's really important that we treat these patients that are diabetics. Also, if the patient's obese, educate them on losing weight. If they have a sedentary lifestyle, tell them they get a walk around and walk, exercise. So these are some of the uh, modifiable risk factors. They're going to ask you questions on which, which are some of the modifiable factors for angina pectoris and which ones are non-modifiable uh, uh, factors. So the ones I just discussed are modifiable because the patient is able to do something about it. It's, they're able to treat it, whether they're obese, they're able to lose weight, whether it's their diet, they're able to change their diet. Now, non-modifiable risk factors is if the patient has a past medical history of it, say their father or their mother died from a heart attack or they had a brother or sibling that died from a heart attack, the patient's age, right, is not modifiable. So the patient, if the patient is older than 60, if the patient is a male, that's something that they are not able to modify. So how is this patient going to present with angina pectoris? I know we discussed it. They're going to have substernal chest pain. They're going to say that they have this pressure, tightness, like crushing, heavy sensation. It's going to last minutes to hour. And sometimes it'll radiate to the upper arm or shoulder or jaw. 
what you need to know about angina pectoris or just like myocardial infarction in general is that what I'm discussing right now is what textbook medicine tells you, right? What usually a patient will present with, but not all patients present like this. Like I said, your diabetics will not present like this. A woman also do not present like this with a myocardial infarction. They present differently. Uh, patients that are obese do not present like this when they're having a myocardial infarction. So just make sure that you have that in the back of your mind. I have had questions on this also uh, that it tells you which one of these patients will not present with the typical symptoms of a heart attack. And you need to know that it's going to be a patient that's an obese patient. If a patient is a female, uh, you're diabetic. Sometimes you'll have patients that will just present with abdominal pain. And abdominal pain, you're like, okay, the heart's up here, your abdomen's all the way down here. Why are they presenting with abdominal pain? So just make sure that you keep that in the back of your mind, especially if they have a past medical history of coronary artery disease or a significant family history for like heart attacks or a patient that just, a family member that just um, died recently, like acutely, like quickly from a myocardial infarction. So how are we going to diagnose these patients? For unstable angina, we're going to do an uh, EKG, we're going to see ST depression, uh, we're going to do cardiac enzymes like we discussed, CKMB and troponin. Troponins are like the best ones to test, so if it tells you which set of enzymes is cardiac enzymes is the best one, they'll have a bunch of them on there, on there. just know that troponin is the best one. Our gold standard is going to be a coronary angiogram. Your cath lab, that's going to tell us what vessel is occluded. So that's why it's the best test to diagnose our unstable angina. How are we going to diagnose stable angina? So we're going to do a stress test. Oh, basically, we're going to stress these patients. Uh, sometimes you can put them on a treadmill or you can do it chemical induced. So you just give them medications that will stress the heart. Uh, cardiac enzymes, once again, troponins for these patients. Uh, cholesterol panel. If it's a stable pan, a stable angina, uh, fasting glucose, right? A1C, CMP, since most of these patients have comorbidities like diabetes. And then what is the treatment? So the first line treatment, and when it asks you, what is the uh, next best treatment for these options? It's always going to be lifestyle modifications. It's always going to be lifestyle modifications. How I think about it with questions is that whatever is the most least non-invasive, it's going to be the best next treatment, right? Now, if it tells you that the patient has tried lifestyle modifications and they're coming back to you and they're still having this chest pain, then that's when you want to intervene with medications. But of course, lifestyle modifications, losing weight, uh, making sure that they're having a good diet, right? Avoiding any types of fatty, fatty foods. So just make sure that you know that lifestyle modifications, if the answer choice is as lifestyle modifications and the patient is newly diagnosed, that's going to be the answer. So like I said, it's going to be weight loss. It's going to be exercise for these patients. Smoking cessation is a huge one. And then controlling their diabetes. So what is a medical treatment for unstable angina or pharmacological treatment? So we're going to give these patients aspirin or clopidogrel, um, whether it's IV or oral beta blockers, nitrates, heparin, or low molecular weight heparin. If the patient has stable angina, the classic regimen is going to be your aspirin, your sublingual nitroglycerin, which is usually as needed. So whenever the patient is going to do something where they're going to exert themselves, uh, tell them to take this nitroglycerin. For example, even if they're going to have sexual intercourse, tell them to take the sublingual nitroglycerin as needed daily, beta blockers, and then daily statins. If it's severe atherosclerosis and it involves more than three vessels, or if it involves like the left coronary artery disease with these patients, you want to make sure that you do a cabbage or angioplasty with stenting. If it's severe atherosclerosis, like I said, and if it involves more than three vessels, and if it involves like the left coronary artery. artery. So let's go into acute coronary syndrome. This is acute plaque rupture and coronary artery thrombosis. It includes what we discussed, which was the unstable angina, the end STEMI, and your STEMIs. So the most common cause of acute coronary syndrome is going to be your atherosclerosis. So it's those vessels, right, that are getting plaque buildup that is decreasing blood flow. How I think about it is like a tube. If you have a bunch of junk in that tube, right, uh, it's going to be harder for things, for water to go through it. And that's the same thing with our vessels. 
uh, risk factors <clears throat> for these, like we discussed, it's going to be diabetics, males, their age, if they're older, greater than 60, hypertension, dyslipidemias, family history, smoking, and obesity. And then we discussed the three, but let's go through them again. We have unstable angina. Like I said, this is subtotal occlusion. On EKG, you're going to see ST depression, and we're going to see negative cardiac enzymes. Because remember, when you think about those steps where we have stable, unstable is worse than stable. These patients are going to have negative EKG, and they're going to have negative troponins. And with these patients, you're going to treat them with antithrombotic therapy, aspirin, and fractionated heparin, low molecular weight heparin, clopidogrel. You can also give them beta blockers, nitrates, morphine, and your calcium channel blockers. And then you have your end stemmies, which is going to be one step more to being severe. This is going to be about 90% occlusion, we said, so subtotal occlusion. On EKG, you're going to see ST depressions, just like unstable angina, but you're going to see positive troponins for these patients. So their troponins are going to be positive because it's telling you that there's some type of cell death going on. Treatment's going to be with your aspirin, unfractionated heparin, low molecular weight heparin, clopidogrel, uh, beta blockers, nitrates, morphines, calcium channel blockers. And then we have our STEMI, which is like your heart attack, right? Your myocardial infarction. This is going to be a step higher than end STEMI. So we said it was unstable angina and STEMI and then STEMI. So STEMI you're going to have your positive EKG. You're going to see those ST elevations, those tombstones. Make sure you know how to read those. Okay, so PQRS, and then you're going to have that ST elevation. It literally looks like tombstones on your EKG. And they're going to have positive troponins, that positive levine sign with a chest pain. And this patient has total occlusion. So 100% of the vessel is occluded with these patients. So let's go into the myocardial infarction since this is a STEMI, right? So this is a cardiac muscle death due to lack of blood flow, most commonly due to endothelial cell dysfunction associated with smoking, atherosclerosis, hyperlipidemia, hypertension that causes a blockage of a coronary artery, most commonly involves the left ventricle, and this patient is going to be presenting with crushing substernal pain, chest pain that radiates to the left arm or jaw. It lasts about 15 to 30 minutes. It's going to be the Levine sign. And pain is not relieved with rest or nitroglycerin. So give these patients nitro and they are not getting better. They can also present with uh, anxiety, sweating, tachycardia, nausea and vomiting, palpitations, dizziness. So just make sure you have that in the back of the mind. Remember I discussed uh, sometimes you have a patient that presents with abdominal pain, nausea and vomiting. And you don't think that is anything related to a heart attack. These patients can also have a silent or a typical myocardial infarction like we discussed earlier. So they can present with dyspnea, abdominal pain, or no symptoms, especially if they're diabetics. This is very commonly seen in your women, obese patients, and elderly patients. We're going to do an EKG on these patients. You're going to see uh, for these patients ST elevation, right? If they've had an infarction, you'll see Q waves. So if they had a previous heart attack, you'll see Q waves on your EKG. What you need to know is what leads are involved in what portion of the heart. So if certain leads on your EKG are affected or you see ST elevations in certain leads, it's going to, what part of the heart is affected? This is very highly tested. So make sure you know this. The most common one tested that you need to know, it's going to be leads 2, 3, and ABF. And that's the most common one I see in the hospital also. 2, 3, and ABF. If you see ST elevations in 2, 3, and AVF, then what is that going to involve? It's going to involve the inferior portion of the heart, like we discussed. And this involves a right coronary artery and the posterior descending branch. Okay. So another one we're going to see is anterior um, portion of the heart is going to be ST elevation in V1 through V4. If it's a septal portion of the heart, you're going to see V1 and V2. And with anterior ST elevations in V1 and 3, V1 through V4, you're going to see the a left anterior descending artery, or that is going to be involved in um, the the one that's going to be occluded. So make sure you know this. Uh, the other one's going to be ST elevations in one AVL, V5, and V6. How I remember this one is that it has AVL, it has an L, so it involves the lateral portion of the heart. So once again, ST elevations in 1, AVL, V5, and V6, it's going to be the lateral portion of the heart, and it's going to involve the left circumflex artery. And then we want to make sure that we're getting our cardiac enzymes 
um, three sets every eight hours. So let's go into now the cardiac enzyme since this is very highly tested. The best one, like I said, for your heart attacks is going to be your troponins. That's why we get these. So troponins rise in four to 12 hours and they remain elevated for up to two weeks. It's the one that stays the longest and it's going to be the gold standard. We also have our myoglobin. This one rises in one to four hours, and it's the first one to show. So if it asks you which one of these is the first one to show, it's going to be the myoglobin. But which one of these is the best one? It's going to be troponin. So myoglobin is going to be the first one. It returns to normal in 24 hours. And then we have our CKMB. It rises in four to 12 hours, and it returns to normal in 36 to 48 hours. So treatment for a myocardial infarction is going to be your MONA, right? It's going to be your mox, um, morphine, oxygen, nitrates, and then aspirin. Once again, morphine, oxygen, nitrates, and aspirin, although I've read certain papers that are now saying that they debunk the MONA, but for a textbook for your medicine, um, textbook exams, just MONA, morphine, oxygen, uh, nitrates, and aspirin. So complications of a myocardial infarction is going to be Drusser's syndrome. This is a post-myocardial pericarditis that is associated with fever and pulmonary infiltrates. So if you have a patient that just had a myocardial infarction and they show up to you like several days before, after and they're showing up with fever and pulmonary infiltrates and they're having pericarditis, think about Dressler syndrome. So let's go into our hypertensive crisis. This includes hypertensive urgency and hypertensive emergency. It's usually a blood pressure that's greater than 180 over 20. So once again, 180 over 20. How you're going to differentiate these two is that one causes end organ damage and the other one does it. I, now, there's a lot of debate on whether hypertensive urgency is even a thing. I've talked to doctors that they're like, it's not even a thing. And then I've talked to other doctors saying that there is because hypertensive urgency, all it is is that a patient presents with a blood pressure that's greater than 180 over 20. And they're asymptomatic. They're perfectly fine. They went, for example, to Walmart. They got a random reading, and it's 180 over 120. So then they freak out. They call their um, their doctor, or sometimes they'll have that insurance card, right? And they turn it to the back, and it says that nurse hotline, the 1-800 number, and they call it, and they tell them the blood pressure. And sometimes, you know, they'll tell them to go to the ER. But usually these patients don't need to go to the ER. If it's a hypertensive urgency, which means that they're usually asymptomatic, they just have a blood pressure that's greater than 180 over 120. So your systolic pressure is going to be greater than 180, and then your diastolic blood pressure is going to be greater than 120. So these patients present like that. They freak out. They're perfectly fine. But these patients can be managed in the clinic. So with these patients, you can manage them in the clinic. Just make sure that they're taking their hypertensive medications, and then you can follow up with them the next day. It's not really an emergency. So that's why there is a huge debate on whether this is a thing or not. Sometimes they'll go to the ER and it's just it just worsens everything. So hypertensive urgency, like I said, increased blood pressure of greater than 180 to 120 with no end organ damage. Treatment for this is that we want to decrease the blood pressure slowly, not quickly, but slowly. It's going to be slowly by 25% in the next 24 to 48 hours with Oral antihypertensives, so things like your clonidine. Clonidine is really good about decreasing your blood pressure. And it decreases it. It's really good. But the thing about it is that you have to be careful because if you stop it, it causes a rebound health retention. Other drugs are Captor Pro, Labetalol, and Nicardipine. Uh, Labetalol is a big one that we use in the hospital. So we usually order IV Labetalol for patients that are hypertensive and then we have like parameters. So for example, if a patient has a blood pressure greater than 180, systolic blood pressure or diastolic pressure greater than 110, then we give them a dose of IV libidolol. So libidolol is a big one that we use in the hospital. Uh, necardipine is another way that you can treat also your hypertensive urgency. So hypertensive emergency. This is increased blood pressure of greater than 180 over 120 with symptoms of end organ damage. So this patient is symptomatic. So it's an emergency for these patients. They have signs and symptoms of end organ damage, like neurological damage. They can have encephalopathy, stroke. If it involves a heart, they can have heart failure, aortic dissection. If it involves the kidneys, it can, they can have hematuria, proteinuria, acute kidney injury. So just make sure you keep that in the back of your mind. You have a patient that has like a episode of 180 over 120 and they're presenting 
with like blood in their urine and protein in your urine, you want to think about hypertensive emergency, retinal damage, also papilledema, blurred vision, retinopathy. I've had these questions so many times and I keep missing them. So make sure that you know this. We're going to treat this by decreasing the blood pressure once again very slowly. We want to avoid rapid blood pressure drop, right? So with these patients, we're going to give them IV sodium nitroprusside, labetalol, hydralazine, acardipine, methodopa, and then we're going to decrease the blood pressure by 10% in the first hour and then an additional 15% in the next two to three hours. Make sure that you know the percentages of how to decrease them because sometimes they'll try to confuse you. So just for recap, hypertensive emergency, we're going to decrease it, the blood pressure by 10% in the first hour and an additional 15% in the next two to three hours. For hypertensive urgency, we're going to slowly decrease the blood pressure by 25% in the next 24 to 48 hours with oral antihypertensives. So next one we're going to go into is hypotension. This is low blood pressure that's less than 90 over 60. What happens with hypotension is that you can have decreased blood flow to your organs, and this can deprive the organs from oxygen, especially the brain. So we have our cardiogenic hypotension. This is usually due to the heart not working. So it's a cause of myocardial dysfunction where the heart is unable to maintain cardiac output. Examples of this is going to be myocarditis, right? If you have the myocardium that's really large and it's not able to allow the heart to contract and pump because it's just inflamed. Other causes of this can be a myocardial infarction, right? If the patient has had a heart attack, if part of that heart is not being perfused by oxygen, like we said, that can cause hypotensive valve dysfunction, um, cardiomyopathies, arrhythmias, and also certain medications can cause hypotensive, like nitroglycerin, because it's a vasodilator. Treatment for this is going to be with oxygen, IV fluids. We want to make sure that we're careful with our IV fluids. We don't want to give them like large amounts of IV fluids or large boluses of IV fluids. Um, ionotropic support with like dobutamine, epinephrine, um, and then also balloon pump. And then we have our orthostatic hypotension. I see this so much in the hospital. This is a drop in blood pressure where the patient changes from a seated position to a standing position. Um, what happens is that they have an inadequate physiological response to the postural change. Very commonly found in your elderly patients. If the patient's dehydrated, most of the patients that we see are burn patients. So they have a, like, a large burn wound in, and usually they're dehydrated. So I see this a lot in my burn patients. If the patient has poor cardiac output, if they're anemic, um, hypothyroidism, hemor if they have any type of hemorrhage going on, this patient is going to be presenting with a positional syncope. I had a patient like this about a month ago. Um, he got up, he went to the restroom, and then he like passed out, and he hit his head on the toilet that we had to end up suturing him on the forehead. And yeah, that's what it was. It was uh, a postural syncope. It could present with dizziness, generalized weakness, and fatigue. Diagnosis, we're going to do the orthostatic vital signs. Basically, what happens with these patients is that we take a blood pressure and their heart rate whenever they're uh, supine and then whenever they are sitting and standing so we're taking their blood pressure and then we usually do several of these to see whether they have orthostatic hypotension if they have any type of systolic drop greater than 20 or a diastolic drop greater than 20, 10 within minutes within three minutes we can diagnose this as orthostatic hypotension treatment we're going to increase water intake and that's what we did with this patient we just gave him a bolus of iv fluids uh, sodium supplementation also if needed, and then we can give them medications like fludrocodosone or pyridostigmine, but usually it's your um, increased water intake or like giving them a bolus of fluids. So then we're going to go into papillary muscle rupture. Papillary muscle rupture. So this is very commonly found in your patients that have post myocardial infarction, especially after three to five days after infarction. So once again, Postmyocardial infarction, three to five days after infarction. Very commonly found in your left ventricle. It can also involve the right ventricle or the, in, the ventricular septum, but very commonly found in your left ventricle. This patient is going to present with a new murmur after having a heart attack. We're going to diagnose this with an echo. And complications with this is just pericardial tamponade. Uh, this patient can, present, can develop mitral regurg and pseudoaneurysm also.
So let's go into our arrhythmias. Make sure you know how to read it, KG, because this is going to be on your exam. I think I had about three <clears throat> EKGs that I need to read, and you need to know how to diagnose them, and then also what, how to diagnose them and how to treat them, and what was the best next line diagnostic type for these patients. So just overall, sinus tachycardia is going to be a heart rate that's greater than 100. For this, we usually want to treat the underlying condition. For example, some people can just have tachycardia and they're asymptomatic. I myself have tachycardia all the time, um, especially like if I work out, if I'm nervous, like I have my Apple Watch, and then it'll like start vibrating and saying that it is recording like a heart rate of greater than like 120 or 130. And then we have sinus brady, a uh, heart rate less than 60. Usually this is normal. In certain athletes, it's normal, but if we have your like our older and frail patients and we want to make sure that we work these patients up. So first line treatment for bradycardia is going to be your atropine. Okay. Uh, definitive tr treatment is going to be a pacemaker. So we place a pacemaker in these patients. And then we have uh, sinus arrhythmia, which is usually irregular due to respiration. Um, they tend to have these arrhythmias that are irregular due to respiration, but it increases with inspira inspiration because there is more preload and it decreases with expiration because it decreases after load. So we also have sick sinus syndrome. This is like a brady tacky sinus arrest that's combined with atrial tachy and bradyarrhythmia so it'll be like fast and then like slow and fast and slow so that's why it's called sick sinus syndrome treatment for this is permanent pacemaker we actually have a patient right now with that in the hospital and then we have our av blocks this is an interruption of normal impulses from the sa node to the av node we have three degrees and you have to be familiar with each one we have a first degree this is a prolonged pr interval that's greater than 0 0.20 seconds and then every P wave is followed by a QRS. Usually with our first degree, we really don't have to do anything. We just observe these patients. And then we have our second degree. We have type 1 and type 2. So our second degree AV block is intermittent non-conducted impulses. So you'll see drop QRSs. So for Mobitz 1, Mobitz 1 so second degree Mobitz 1 or second degree Winky Back, you're going to see a progressive PR interval lengthening than a dropped QRS. So you're going to see a PR interval. It's going to be larger, larger, larger. And then, boop, the um, QRS is going to um, drop, okay? And then for the first degree, what you're going to see is just a fixed, prolonged PR interval. It's going to be fixed. So it's not decreasing or increasing. It's just going to be fixed, first degree, versus our second degree type 1, which is going to your winky back. This one is, like, decreasing every single time until you have a dropped QRS. And usually with our second degree uh, type 1 winky back, AV blocks, we really don't have to do anything. We just observe these patients. So then we move on to our second degree Mobitz type 2. This is where the patient has a constant or prolonged PR interval. With a second degree Mobitz type 2, we have to work these patients up because these patients can go into having a third degree AV block. So third degree AV block is where there's complete AV dissociation. So the P waves and the QRSs are not communicating at all. Like they're doing whatever they want to do. So you have P waves that are not related to the QRSs and this is causes decreased cardiac output. So once again, we want to work these up. So once again, first degree, really don't have to work these patients up. Don't have to really treat them. Second degree, uh, type one, your winky back, don't really have to work these patients up or treat them. When we t talk about our second degree type 2 and our third degree, we have to work these patients up, okay? And then treat these patients. So then we have our wandering atrial pacemaker. This is going to be a rate that's less than 100 beats per minute, and you're going to see more than three different types of P waves on your EKG. And then we have our multifocal atrial tachycardia. The rate is going to be greater than 100 beats per minute. And usually with a MAT or multifocal atrial tachycardia, it's associated with severe COPD. And then we have our WPW, or with Parkinson White. Uh, this is where the patient has an accessory pathway. So if we think about it, right? So we have the nodes, right? One node, two node, and then you go through the bundle of his. So these patients will have an accessory pathway. So SA node, AV node, and then you go through the bundle of his, right? Which goes around like that in the heart. These patients are going to have an accessory pathway. So with these, this um, accessory pathway, 
they're going to have it via the bundle of Kent. And what happens is that it pre-excites the ventricle. So you're going to see a delta wave. So a delta wave is usually pathognomonic for WPW. So you'll see that delta wave. It really looks like a wave, like if you're riding a wave. You're going to see a shortened PR interval. Shortened PR interval. Shortened PR interval. I got this on a question. I got it wrong. So once again, the delta wave and a shortened PR interval for our WPW. Treatment for this is usually with your vagal maneuvers. Um, you're going to give them procainamide. And then definitive treatment is going to be your radio frequency ablation. So you're going to go in there and get rid of that. Um, uh, you're going to burn that accessory pathway. Then we have torsades of points. This is usually due to hypomagnesemia. The patient does not have enough magnesium. Um, basically, it's VTAC that twists around a baseline. To me, it kind of looks like a ribbon. If you would like twist a ribbon and you twist it, it looks like that. It literally looks like that. So that's why it's called torsades de points. Torsades in Spanish is torcido, twisted. Then we have pulseless electrical activity, PEA. This is an organized rhythm that's seen on a monitor, but the patient has no palpable pulse. So you see a rhythm there, but you feel a pulse and the patient has no pulse whatsoever. Uh, treatment for this is usually going to be your CPR, your epinephrine for these patients, and then check for shockable rhythm every two minutes. So let's go into our conduction disorders. We have atrial fibrillation. This is an uncoordinated atrial activity. It's the most common type of sustained dysrhythmia. This is where the atria is not contracting, but it's producing electrical impulses. So it's just like quivering there. And uh, etiology for this, the risk factors, you have hypertension, heart disease, coronary artery disease, rheumatic heart disease. On EKG, you're not going to see any P waves. So whenever I look at an EKG, the first thing I do is, of course, you're going to look to see whether it's normal or abnormal. But you also want to look for P waves. If there are no P waves present, you want to think about atrial fibrillation. So that's the first thing I do. See if there's any P waves, right? Those like little humps before your QRS is, are they present? If they're not, you want to think about atrial fibrillations. They're not going to have any P waves, okay? And then another thing with this is that the rhythm is going to be irregularly irregular. So what does that mean? So what that means is that if you get a piece of paper, like for example, if I get a piece of paper, so this is my big pencil. So if I get a piece of paper and you measure you see this. So you get this piece of paper and you're measuring the the rhythm. So you're measuring one peak to another peak, right, on your EKGs. So say we have, which I'm going to draw a rhythm right here. Sorry, this is a really bad one. So we have like a rhythm here, right? So we have a rhythm here. And then you, if I measure this, and then I grab it here, it's supposed to be equal, okay? So if I measure this with my fingers, and then I go here, that's supposed to be equal. This would be, for example, AFib. I'm sorry, I know it doesn't look like AFib, because if I measure this, this is not equal to this. And then I keep going like this. That's what irregular, irregular means, is that you're measuring that length of the from uh, your P wave, so from your P wave, and then you're measuring it every single one, and it's not it's not equal, it's not regular. It's one will be thinner than the next one, one will be thin, one will be large, one will be thin, one will be large. And that's how uh, I also diagnose that, is that you're gonna see it's gonna be irregularly irregular. So the rhythm is not gonna be irregular, okay? For these patients. Uh, treatment is stable. If the patient is stable, you wanna rate control, so it's always, um, for these patients, we're going to give them diltiazem. You can give them metropol. Also, if the patient is unstable, so if you have a patient that presents and they are, like, passed out, um, you, then you want to cardio abort them because we're going to rhythm control in that case. And then you also want to make sure that we anticoagulate these patients because, like I said, that atria is just, like, quivering, and these patients are very prone to getting clots. They're very prone to developing pulmonary embolism, um, getting heart attacks, so we want to make sure that we anticoagulate these patients with warfarin. Uh, if whenever we anticoagulate a patient with warfarin, we want to do the keep the INR between two to three. So in these patients, we want to keep the INR two to three. Okay. 
And then we have atrial flutter. This is an atrial rate between 250 to 300 beats per minute. This causes decreased cardiac output. What happens is that the AV node conducts every two to three atrial impulses. So every two to three atrial impulses. And some of the causes of this is going to be hypertension, ischemic heart disease, rheumatic heart disease, cardiomyopathies. You're going to see your sawtooth pattern. This is what's going to be pathognomonic for your A flutter. It literally looks like a sawtooth pattern on your EKG. Uh, you're not going to see any pay, P waves, so no P waves, narrow QRS complexes. And the rate's going to be regular. So the rate's going to be regular. It's not going to be like all over the place, large, huge, large. Um, it's going to be regular. So from the moment you start your P wave to the end of the T wave, you measure that, it's going to be regular. Everything's going to be regular versus your atrial fibrillation. We said from the P wave to like the end of the T wave, you're, you'll have one that's large, you have one that's narrow, you have one that's wide, one that's narrow, and that's how you're able to see that it's irregularly irregular. Okay. And then um, this patient, you're going to treat them if they're stable, you're going to treat them with... Uh, Calcium channel blockers or beta blockers. If they're unstable, then you're going to cardiovert them. Definitive treatment is going to be with radiofrequency ablation. And then we have our paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia, your uh, PSVT. This is acute onset of tachycardia. Okay, and then we have um, our SVT, so supraventricular tachycardia. This is going to be a dysrhythmia due to reentrant uh, conduction pathway. They're very, very similar. So. What is the etiology of both of these? It's very commonly found in your young, healthy patients. Also very commonly found in your pediatrics. Usually it's normal in these patients. Um, if a patient has a mitral disease, of course, that's going to be abnormal. Uh, also seen in digital toxicity. Certain drugs or toxins can cause your SVT or PSVT, uh, hyperthyroidism, caffeine. This patient is going to be presenting with palpitations, dizziness, dyspnea, syncope, angina, fatigue, nausea and vomiting, diaphoresis. On EKG, you'll see no visible P waves. You're going to have an atrial rate of 120 to 200, but the rhythm is going to be regular, and they're going to have a narrow QRS. So that's another thing that you want to do. So you want to first look at your EKG, right? You want to see, well, are there any P waves present? Okay, there are. Uh, is it regular or is it irregular? Okay, it's regular. Is it a narrow complex or is it a wide complex? If you're seeing a narrow complex and you want to think, or a narrow QRS complex, you want to think about your fast ones, so your supraventricular tachycardia and your paroxysmal uh, ventricular tachycardia. So treatment for this is a patient is stable. You want to do vagal maneuvers, so something like cold stimulus to the face. So they say like a bucket of um, cold water for these patients, Valsava. So the patient can blow through a straw or stimulate the gag reflex. And then after you've done that, then you can do adenosine or calcium channel blockers. These are AV nodal blocking agents. And if the patient's unstable, once again, cardioversion. So cardioversion, cardioversion is going to be for your unstable patients. And then we have our bundle branch block. So this is abnormal conduction abnormalities in which ventricles depolarize in sequence rather than simultaneously. So we have our right bundle branch block and then we have our left bundle branch block. So a right bundle branch block, you're going to see a wide QRS complex that's going to be greater than 120 milliseconds. You're going to see a wide S wave in lead one, and you're going to see a triphasic QRS also. So how I memorize this is the mnemonic William Marrow. So William, you have a W. So W is going to be NV1 because that's the beginning of that word. And then M is going to be on V6. And since it has the L in the middle, it's going to be your left bundle branch block. So William and then Marrow, M is going to be on V1. And then W is going to be on V6. So since you have R in the middle, it's going to be your right bundle branch block. So that's how I memorize it. William Marrow. So once again, just for sake of repetition, hopefully if this mnemonic works for you, hope so. So William Marrow. L is in the middle of a William, so it's going to be the left bundle branch block. You're going to see literally like a W on V1, okay? And then on V6, um, you're going to see a M shape. And that's going to be your left bundle branch block, right? Versus your right bundle branch block on marrow, you have R in the middle. You're going to see M on your V1 and then W on your V6 because it's William marrow. 
And that's how you differentiate these two types. So left under branch block, white QRS complex greater than 120 seconds. Like I said, we're going to see a large R wave in lead one, and then you're going to see a negative wave in lead V1. All right. Or like I said, how you can use that, or like I discussed, using the mnemonic will you marry? It's worked for me. Uh, VTAC, this is an AV dissociation with independent pacing of the atrium ventricles more than three consecutive PVCs rate greater than 100. So once again, AV dissociation with independent pacing of the atrium ventricles that causes more than three consecutive PVCs. So PVCs are like literally those deep, they look like deep V waves on your EKG. So it's going to be more than three of those. And the rate's going to be more than 100. So diagnosis, we're going to do an EKG. We're going to see capture beats and fusion beats. You'll see two foci firing spontaneously, and you're going to see a wide QRS complex tachycardia. So like I said, you're going to look at these. To differentiate these type of tachycardias, you're going to look at the EKG. And you're going to see, is this a wide QRS or a narrow QRS? And this will tell you a lot. If it's a narrow QRS, we're thinking about our PSVT or our SVT, right? If it's a wide QRS, then we're thinking about our V. Tech. So treatment for this is a patient is stable, we're going to do amiodarone. If they're unstable with a pulse, we're going to do synchronized cardioversion. If they're unstable without a pulse, then we're going to do defibrillation with CPR. So make sure you know that. VFib. This is going to be completely disorganized. This is going to look like throw up. It doesn't even look like, it does not, it's not going to have its beautiful like PRS and the QRS and then the T waves. No, this is just going to look like like throw up. So with VFib, it's going to be completely disorganized. It's going to be, uh, these patients have usually immediate cessation of cardiac output and they have no associated pulse. This is an emergency. Diagnosis is going to be an EKG. You're going to see no discernible P waves. Yeah, you won't see any P waves on there. Uh, you'll see uh, WRS complexes, no WRS complexes or T waves. So none of that. It's going to look like throw up. You can't find any of your P you can't find anything on there. So none of your P waves, because then none of your T waves and none of your WRS complexes. Treatment for this is going to be defibrillation with CPR. Then we have our premature beats. This is going to be SA node uh, to AV to bundle of his to right uh, left bundle branches to Purkinje fibers. Patients are usually going to be symptomatic. Uh, sometimes it can also be asymptomatic, though we're going to present with lightheadedness. So we have a premature atrial contractions, and then we have our PVCs. So our PVCs literally look like a V. And then for our PACs, this is where the atrium contracts earlier than expected in cardiac cycle. Uh, you're going to see ectopic foci. You're going to see an early P wave and then a non-compensatory pause. Treatment for this is going to be usually with beta blockers and calcium channel blockers. And then our PVCs, like I said, it's going to be those Vs. On EKG, you're going to see that wide, bizarre QRS happening earlier than usual. You will not see a P wave. There's going to be a compensatory pause. Treatment, really nothing is needed for your PVCs. So let's go into syncope. This is a sudden transient loss of consciousness along with loss of posterous tone. It's usually due to a dysfunction of bilateral cerebral hemispheres or reticular activating system in the brain stem. Some of the causes of this is there's different types. So you have your vasovagal, you have your dysrhythmia, and then you have your orthostatic. So vasovagal is usually mediated by the orthostatic or emotional stress. So a patient gets scared or they get really upset over something that can go into vasovagal. It can also be reflex mediated. So if they cough, if they sneeze, if they go to the restroom like number two, sometimes during exercising or after eating, so prosprandial. Sometimes you'll have, I read a question about a patient that was putting a um, tie on and just tied it too hard. It causes it like vasovagal, right? And then that's why they passed out. And then we have our dysrhythmia syncope. This is usually due to an AV block. Uh, with these patients, we want to make sure that we're we're working them up right because they have some type of cardiac problem, whether it's an AV block, whether it's tachy Brady syndrome, SVT, VTAC, uh, pulmonary embolism, aortic dissection, pulmonary hypertension, cardiomyopathy. When we think about cardiomyopathy, right, we think about HOCAM, which is our hypertrophic um, cardiomyopathy, especially like in your young athletes. 
We want to think about your cardiomyopathies, valvular diseases also, uh, orthostatic syncope. This is usually due to alcohol, vasodilators, um, so your medications like nitro, for example, diuretics, antidepressants, Parkinson's, Lewy body dementia, hemorrhage, um, diarrhea and vomiting because these patients are losing a lot of fluid, right? And then our diabetics. So signs and symptoms with syncope, they're going to present with transient loss and postural tone. So transient loss and postural tone. They're going to be confused, but they will not have a post-ictal state. This is usually what differentiates it from a seizure. So these patients will not have a post-ictal state. It usually tends to last for a few seconds, and then the patient feels better after the event. So they have rapid recovery following the event. So if it's a vasovagal syncope, they're going to have a prodrome of nausea and vomiting, warmth, pallor, lightheadedness, and diaphoresis. Diagnosis for syncope, we're going to do an EKG first because we always want to make sure that we're ruling out our deadly causes like heart attacks, our blocks, right, our AB blocks. So we want to do an EKG to rule out any type of arrhythmia. And then we also, uh, we, we do an EEG. Um, usually it's going to be normal because it's going to rule out seizures. And then we have the San Francisco syncope rule, which is going to be your chest. Uh, C is for CHF. H is going to be for hematocrit less than 30%. E is going to be for EKGs normal. S is going to be for shortness of breath. Um, and then you have your second S, which is going to be for systolic blood pressure less than 90. So we want to think about also this. And treatment is usually supportive, but it also depends on what is underlying cause, right? If it's a cardiac problem, you want to make sure that we fix the underlying cause. So let's go into cardiogenic shock, cardiogenic shock. So cardiogenic shock is due to decreased blood flow through the entire body circulation. Uh, usually what happens is that there's some type of failure going on, which causes cellular damage, which causes organ failure. So some of the causes of cardiogenic shock is hypovolemic. So you have low fluid volume, hemorrhagic or non-hemorrhagic also. Um, and we also have dehydration, if they have any type of wounds or if, the if they're bleeding, if they just had a myocardial infarction. Um, signs and symptoms, the patient's going to be hypotensive, tachycardic. They're, they're going to have that cool, clammy extremity, so they're going to have this cold shock. Diagnosis, usually clinical, and then treatment for this is ABC. So we want to make sure that we protect their airway, breathing, and circulation. And then fluid replacement is a key for cardiogenic shock give them supplemental oxygen, and then vasoconstrictors. So let's go into CHF, congestive heart failure. This is a disorder due to the pumping ability of the heart where the heart can't supply enough blood to meet the body's demands. The most common type is going to be systolic. So we have systolic and we have diastolic. So when we think about systolic, it's due to <clears throat> um, things like coronary artery disease. While the most common cause of diastolic is usually due to chronic hypertension. So some of the risk factors for con congestive heart failure is hypertension, like we discussed, atherosclerosis, coronary artery disease, diabetes is one of the big ones also. If the patient had a previous myocardial infarction, because what happens is it causes uh, scarring, so the heart isn't able to contract or pump blood like it used to. Also, any type of cardiomyopathy can lead to congestive heart failure, which happens that like the heart is just not pumping once again like it used to, um, atrial septal defects, and if the patient has any type of chronic lung disease, like COPD, for example. So we have different types. We have our systolic heart failure, and then we have our diastolic heart failure. So a systolic heart failure is when your heart is very, very floppy. So it's floppy. It's not strong like it used to, so it's not pumping hard enough. So it's very lazy. How I think about, <clears throat> about it is that you blow up a balloon, right? If you blow up to the balloon and then you fill it up too much air, once you take out the air, it's going to be very like floppy, right? It's the same thing. The heart is just very floppy. You can't pump. Sorry for making that sound. I was trying to make like a floppy heart sound, but it's very floppy. It's very lazy. It can't pump like it used to because it's just floppy. So what happens is the heart muscle loses its strength. The ventricles are able to fill with enough blood, but they just can't eject it. So they have trouble ejecting it to the body because once again, it's going to be this floppy heart that is not working. So 
this patient's going to be presenting with decreased cardiac output and they're going to have reduced ejection fraction, right? So ejection fraction, like pumping that blood out, it's going to be reduced because once again, this, this heart cannot pump or contract like it used to. So usually the reduced ejection fracture is going to be less than 40%. And then these patients are going to have thin ventricular walls. And then we have the other type, which is going to be diastolic. So once again, we have systolic and diastolic. Out of the two, systolic heart failure is the most common one. This is where the heart can't pump hard enough, like we said. This is about 95% of heart failure versus uh, your, your diastolic, it's about 5% of heart failure. So diastolic heart failure, this is where the heart can't fill enough. So what happens is that you have this very, very stiff heart. It's very stiff and it's not able to fill and relax like it used to because it's just very, very stiff versus your systolic. We said this was a very floppy heart where it can fill, but it just can't pump out. This heart is for diastolic is a stiff heart. It's able to pump out, but it just cannot relax and fill. So it's just like very, very stiff. It's not able to like relax. It's just stiff. So whenever you have something that's very stiff, right, you can't fill it with enough blood. So what happens is that you have a left heart muscle that can't fill prop can't fill properly, cannot, but it can contract. So what happens is that you have blood that backs up into the pulmonary circulation. So you have reduced preload with these patients. You have both systolic volume and total volume that's going to be low but you're gonna have preserved ejection fraction because like I said, this heart is able to contract. They are able to push blood out, out, but they just cannot relax to fill that ventricle with enough blood that it needs to, right? You have your atria and then you have your ventricle. So the atria will open and it'll fill the ventricle, but this heart's really stiff. So it's not able to fill or relax like it should be, but it can contract perfectly fine versus our systolic heart failure the heart is just floppy so it's not able to pump like it used to it doesn't have that force to like pump out so that's why these patients with systolic heart failure have reduced ejection fraction while diastolic uh, heart failure they have preserved ejection fraction so they have an ejection fraction of between 55 to 70 percent this is something that's very highly tested so make sure that you know the difference between these so with Diastolic heart failure, you're going to have thick ventricular walls. And what you need to know about these, like I said, is that sometimes systolic heart failure is, you'll hear it in the hospital, like heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, right? Because the heart is not contracting. And then your uh, diastolic heart failure, you'll see, you'll hear like heart failure with preserved ejection fraction because the ejection fraction is normal. It's just a heart that's very restricted and it can't relax where it can't fill blood out. So then you have your left heart failure and your right heart failure. Make sure that you know the differences between these two. So you have left heart failure. This is where the blood backs up into the lungs. This is going to cause anything pulmonary symptom-wise. So this patient's going to have a cough. Sometimes they'll have like a blinched, blood-tinged cough, a sputum, or it'll say like a pink, like frothy sputum on your question stem. And then that's when you want to think about a left heart failure. Uh, they're going to have congestion, cough, crackles, wheezing, tachypnea. So they're going to be breathing really, really fast or have restlessness, confusion, or thopnea. So that means when they lay down, they feel like they just can't breathe because all that fluid is backing up. They'll have paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, tachycardia, exertional dyspnea, fatigue, cyanosis. So it will be blue and they'll have these chain stokes breathing. So left heart failure, as you can see, it's anything pulmonary related. Because if we think about the anatomy, everything's going to back up into the lungs, right? Versus our right heart failure, this is usually symptoms uh, where the blood is backed up into the body. So with the right heart failure, you're going to have more like um, general body symptoms. So you're going to have edema. So you have like lower extremity edema. You're going to have jugular venous distension like right here. You're going to have ascites, hepatosplenomegaly waken pitting edema in the lower extremities diagnosis for this is going to be with a chest x-ray uh, for your congestive heart failure it's a best initial test to start with so if it tells you what's the best initial it's going to be a chest x-ray so make sure that you read your question stem so if you have a patient that you're thinking that they have congestive heart failure right because they're presenting with nocturnal dyspnea which is usually how they're going to present 
And then on top of that, they have like some edema to the right lower extremities, like they have the pink frothy sputum or something like that. You're thinking about congestive heart failure and it tells you what's the best initial diagnostic type. You're going to do an x-ray. In x-ray, you're going to see your curly beelines and effusions. This is usually a pathognomonic for CHF on your exams. And then you're going to do an echo. So an echo is going to confirm and get the ejection fraction to tell you whether it's a systolic or diastolic type of heart failure and to tell you what is a prognosis. Also, an echo will usually tell you the ejection fraction. And then we're going to do labs. Also, you're going to see an elevated BNP. Why? Because this is released because there is volume overload where the body's trying to reverse this volume overload. And then make sure that you know the, NYH, the New York Heart Association or NYHA classifications, right? You're, so your different classes. So class one is going to be the patient has no symptoms whatsoever, so asymptomatic. Class two, the patient has symptoms with strenuous exercise and they're only asymptomatic at rest. Class three is gonna be symptoms of mild exercise and asymptomatic at rest. And then class four is gonna be symptoms at rest all the time. Treatment for congestive heart failure, we wanna make sure that initially, right, we said that usually initial is gonna be your lifestyle changes. So you're gonna educate the patient on the importance of diet, exercise, low salt, fluid restriction, less than two liters a day. And then for medications, we're gonna give them ACE inhibitors, okay? This is a vasodilator that decreases afterload. And then also our diuretics. So diuretics will get rid of all that fluid. So furosemide to decrease the preload. So in the hospital where we're at, if we have a, I had a patient that had CHF, and then sometimes he would go in the room, he's fine, and the next day he would go in there and he was like, you could see he was having like really, really bad trouble breathing. And so in this patient, we would just give him like a dose of furosemide and um, Lasix and he would be like perfectly fine the next day. So it's just clearing out all that um, overflow of liquid that they have. Also, furosemide decreases preload. So aside from furosemide, other medications that you can give, you can give hydralazine. This is going to help decrease the arterial, arterial pressure. And then another thing that you can give besides hydralazine is nitrates. Nitroglycerin is going to decrease the venous pressure. Beta blockers like uh, your metropolar, right? This is going to slow the patient's heart rate. And then if the patient has a late stage congestive heart failure, we can give them diur diuretics like spironolactin. This causes hyperkalemia, so we want to make sure that we're monitoring the potassium in these patients. And then we can also give digoxin. So digoxin is going to give that heart that extra contractility, so it's going to help the heart contract. And then Another thing that we can give, well, actually, the definitive treatment for this is going to be heart transplant, right? So a new heart for these patients. Another thing that you need to know is that um, ACE inhibitors are, they help with uh, cardiac, um, they help with the heart, basically, and they prevent cardiac remodeling. So next topic we're going to go into is going to be pericarditis. This is an inflammation of the outermost surface layer of the heart. This can lead to fluid collection in the pericardial air space and then when there is excessive fluid in the pericardial space that cause prevents the heart from contracting it just is causing all this pressure on the heart this can cause pericardial tamponade so the most common cause of pericarditis is going to be viral so it causes like enterovirus coxsackie virus echovirus and then your dresser syndrome which is what we just talked about recently right this dresser syndrome is common in those patients that just had a myocardial infarction like two to five days after a heart attack. Sometimes other causes can be idiopathic, uh, tuberculosis, uremia. I saw this a lot during my nephrology rotation was uh, uremic pericarditis. So patients that have like chronic renal failure, um, they tend to develop this uremic pericarditis. Also traumatic, like we said, so any type of like stab wounds or anything um, that can cause like blood to stay in that pericardium that can lead to cardiac tamponade and then SLE also. So how is this patient going to present? They're going to be presenting with positional chest pain. So chest pain that is positional and they're going to have this sharp pleuritic chest pain that's worse with inspiration and it's better with sitting up or leaning forward but it's worse whenever the patient lays down. This is usually pathognomonic for your pericarditis and they may or may not present with fever depending on what the underlying causes and then the what is like 
the buzzword that you're going to hear for, you're going to read for pericarditis is that it's going to say that there's a friction rub. There will also be muffled heart sounds, pulses paradox. Usually when you see pulses paradoxes, you want to think about cardiac tamponade. So diagnosis, best initial test is going to be an EKG. You're going to see diffuse ST elevation, but the definitive diagnostic test for these patients is going to be the echo. So make sure, as always, to see what the question is asking you. If it asks you what is the best initial test, you can do an EKG. If it asks you what's a definitive test to diagnose this patient, it's going to be an echocardiogram. Treatment is going to be with NSAIDs. We're usually just going to be in, uh, given something like endomethacin, ibuprofen, naproxen. You may or may not give them steroids, but if the patient has cardiac tamponade, which is severe, you want to do something like pericardiosynthesis or any type of like effusion. So speaking of effusions, let's go into pericardial effusions. This is fluid and immune cells that move into the tissue and fluid um, that pulls that causes more than 100 milliliters to be uh, causing all this pressure on the heart where the heart just cannot fill up with blood because it cannot relax. So some of the causes of this is acute or chronic pericarditis because this causes, once again, inflammation of a layer that is surrounding the heart, right? If we think about the different layers of the heart, pericardium is the one that surrounds the heart. This patient's going to be presenting with fever, chest pain. Uh, the chest pain is worse with heavy breathing, better with sitting up or leaning forward. They're going to have decreased heart sounds, decreased cardiac output, shortness of breath low blood pressure, lightheadedness, and they're going to have that friction rub that we discussed earlier that you hear upon auscultation. And then diagnosis is going to be an EKG. We're going to see low voltage QRS. Low voltage QRS. This is something you're going to see on the exam. You're going to have a patient that presents with pericarditis, and then on EKG, it'll say low voltage QRS. Pulses alternance, once again, very, very buzzwordy for pleural fusion and your um, pericarditis, so pleural fusion, sorry, pulses artinence, and then a chest x-ray, you're going to see a water bottle appearance, but echo, once again, is going to be the best test for these patients. So treatment's going to be your pain relief. You're going to treat the underlying cause, whether um, if the patient has like a severe fusion, you want to do pericardial synthesis, right? You want to go in there and remove all that fluid. So now we're going to go into cardiac tamponade. This is a pericardial effusion that is causing significant pressure on the heart that causes restriction of the cardiac ventricular filling. So there's so much pressure within that pericardial sac that the heart cannot relax fully and fill to pump out the enough blood that it needs to to the rest of the heart. So basically you have decreased cardiac output with these patients. So some of the causes of this is pericarditis, pericardial fusion, like we discussed, pericardial fluid pressure that exceeds chamber pressure that leads to the collapse. Uh, the thing you need to know about this one is the signs and symptoms. It's going to be your Bex triad. So the Bex triad is going to be your distant muffled heart sounds. It's going to be your hypotension and then your increased jugular venous pressure. Once again, very testable. This is going to be a patient that's presenting with hypotension. On auscultation, you're going to see de you're going to hear decreased heart sounds, and they're going to have uh, increased jugular venous pressure. So they're also going to be presenting with pulses, paradoxes, dyspnea, fatigue, peripheral edema, and then uh, reflux tachycardia. They're going to have cool extremities. They'll have the Kuzmal sign, which is increased jugular venous pressure with inspiration, and then they're going to have pulseless electrical activity. This is an emergency. Diagnosis is going to be with an echo. You're going to see presence of effusion plus diastolic collapse of the cardiac chambers. And treatment is we want to go in there and remove all the fluid, right? We want to do that immediate pericardial synthesis. So now we're going to go into our next topic, which is going to be acute bacterial endocarditis. This is an inflammation and infection of the innermost layer of the heart. It's acute and subacute. It's usually due to a hematogenous spread. Uh, some of the causes of this are heart surgery, prosthetic valves. Usually if it's prosthetic valves, the bacteria that is involved is um, S. epidermis. Also high valvular disease like stenotic by mitral valve prolapse, PDA, if the patient had a dental surgery. The most common valve affected in acute bacterial endocarditis is going to be the mitral valve because for some reason 
Streptococcus loves the mitral valve, so make sure that you know that. But if the patient is an IV drug abuser, the most common valve affected is going to be the tricuspid valve. So make sure that you know the differences between that. If it tells you it's a new patient that's coming in for a new heart murmur, they're having fever, and they just look really sick, and it asks you, you're suspecting endocarditis, and it asks you what's the most common valve affected in these patients, it's going to be the tricuspid valve for an uh, IV drug abuser. Now, if it's any other patient, like you want to think about the mitral valve, because strep loves the mitral valve for some reason. So... The most common bacterial cause for IV drug abusers is going to be staph aureus. So if you think about it, drug abusers like to obviously inject needles, right? And what bacteria is very commonly found in their skin? It's going to be staph, and that's how I think about it. So staph aureus is the most common culprit for your IV drug abusers, which affects what? The tricuspid valve versus like everyone else, it's going to be the um, mitral valve, right? So streptococcus is usually the cause for anyone else besides an IV drug abuser for endocarditis. So how is this patient going to present? They're going to have fever, like I said, new onset murmur. It's going to be a young patient that presents with a new murmur. Usually when we think about murmur, it's, it's someone that's young or if they have any type of, for example, congenital disorder like PDA, VSD, right? Um, or your older patients, but if it's a young, like middle-aged patient that's coming in and they have like a new onset of memory, you want to think about your acute bacterial endocarditis, also petechiae, splinter hemorrhages, which are going to be your um, nail, nail bed, right? Uh, Oster nodes or oster nerds are the ones that are going to be, they're very, very painful. Uh, they're usually like on <clears throat> the pads of the, the fingers, and then you have Janeway lesions, which are going to be painless. So I memorized these is that ulcer nodes have an O. So it's ulcer nodes for ouch. So these are painful versus your Janeway lesions are going to be painless. And then you're going to have raw spots. Uh, these patients can also present with glomerular nephritis. You're going to have a positive um, RF factor, flu-like symptoms, malaise, weight loss, and and vomiting. So the thing that you need to know is that if it's Endocarditis is, has a very rapid onset in IV drug abusers. So make sure you know that. I've had questions where sometimes they just show you a picture of an eye exam and you need to suspect that the patient has rot spots and it's associated with acute bacterial endocarditis. So how are we gonna diagnose this? We're gonna do the, do the Duke's criteria. This is very highly tested. So make sure that you know this. For the Duke's criteria, you need to have either two major or one major plus three minor. So for the major criteria, you're going to have either a positive blood culture or an abnormal echocardiogram. For the minor criteria, it's going to be either a fever, a predisposing heart condition, or IV drug abuse, vascular phenomena like ulcer nodes, raw spots, nephritis, or positive RF. Cultures should be taken before initiating antibiotics. That's really important because we don't want to start antibiotics on these patients and then we've killed off all the bacteria, and then it's probably going to give us a false bacterial infection, or we won't be able to find the culprit of the endocarditis. So that's why it's really important that we take cultures before we start antibiotics, because the culture is the most accurate diagnostic test, okay? The best initial test, though, is going to be an echocardiogram. Treatment, this is an emergency, so we want to make sure that we do our ABCs, right? Airway, breathing, circulation. If the patient is septic, then we're going to give them fluids and vasopressors like norepinephrine or dopamine. And then impaired antibiotic is usually what we're going to give them. We're going to give them something like vancomycin and gentamicin. And then we want to make sure that for prophylaxis, we give it to all patients with prosthetic heart valves. If they have a history of endocarditis, if they have congenital heart disease or mitral valve prolapse with a murmur. This is uh, required prophylaxis for any of these patients that I discussed that have any of this in their history for any dental surgery, tonsillectomy, appendectomy, and the medication that we're going to choose is uh, amoxicillin. If the patient's allergic, then we can do clindamycin, so amoxicillin. So now we're going to go into peripheral arterial disease. This is going to be an atherosclerotic disease of the lower extremities. And what happens is that there's areas of claudication, some of the etiologies, you'll have aortic bifurcation, 
uh, usually it involves also the common iliac, femoral, popliteal, tibial, and perineal arteries. So these are going to be the arteries that are going to be usually involved in your peripheral arterial disease or your PAD. This patient's going to be presenting with intermittent claudication. What is this? This is the patient presents with pain whenever they're walking, and it gets better whenever they rest. So it gets worse whenever they walk. It gets better when they rest. This is how you're going to differentiate it from peripheral vascular disease, because peripheral artery disease is pain with walking relieved by rest. These patients are going to have uh, resting leg pain, though, if it's an advanced. It's very, very advanced. These patients can also develop gangrene if it's not treated. And these patients can also develop um, acute arterial embolism, which is where the patient presents with paresthesias, pain, pallor, pulsinessness, paralysis, poplithermia, levitoreticularis. So it's going to be the, your, your P's, right? Your paralysis, your paresthesias, your pallor, your pulsinessness, your, your poplithermia. Uh, we want to think about an acute arterial embolism, which just means that you have an emboli that is just decreasing blood flow to that leg. So we want to make sure that we treat these patients as soon as we can. So a treatment for like acute arterial embolism, it's going to be heparin for the emb embolism and then thrombolytics for a thrombus. So that's a thrombus is a clot that's stuck to a vessel wall. You may also may need to do an embolectomy. Okay. So once again, heparin for an embolism. Embolism is just a free floating clot that is just a, uh, decreasing blood flow to the lower extremity. And then thrombolytics is going to be for thrombus, which is a clot that's stuck to the vessel. So once again, that's going to be for acute arterial embolism. So peripheral arterial disease, discussing that also, this patient is going to present with decreased pulses, decreased capillary refill. It'll say that the patient has hair loss, shiny skin, thick nails, cool skin, but they will not have any edema. And they're also going to present with lateral malleolar low ulcers. So lateral malleolar ulcers, okay? So make sure that you know that. Diagnosis for peripheral artery disease is going to be with an ABI. So it's going to be an ankle brachial index. If it's less than 0 0.90, it's positive, then that means the patient has peripheral arterial disease. Um, if it's less than 0 0.40, then that means it's severe peripheral artery disease. The gold standard, though, it's going to be an arteriography or... Um, so you go in there and you look at the arteries themselves. Treatment's going to be plate inhibitors, so something like aspirin, silostazole, clopidogrel, like Plavix. You can also do revascularization. So this is where you go in there and you do bypass grafts, endarterectomy. Now, if the limb has already become gangrenous because the patient, for example, has severe peripheral artery disease, then the patient's going to have to have it amputated. And then, of course, make sure that we treat whatever underlying causes comorbidities a patient has, so if they're hypertensive, if they have diabetes, coronary disease, we want to make sure that we treat this since most of these patients tend to have these comorbidities and they're associated with peripheral arterial disease. All right, guys, so let's go into deep venous thr thrombosis. So deep venous thrombosis, we have the virtuous triad for these patients. The mnemonic that I memorize is she. So you're going to have stasis, okay, and then H is going to be for hypercoagulability, and then E is going to be for endothelial damage. So that's going to be my mnemonic that I have for DVT. So, D so DVT is where you have a clot that um, lodges itself in one of your veins. So most of these clots tend to originate in the lower in the calf. So this is where most of the clots come in from. So how is this patient going to present? They're going to be presenting with unilateral edema of the leg. They're going to have calf pain or tenderness. Uh, if you do the Holman sign, which is calf pain with dorsiflexin of the leg, this is going to be positive. You'll see some local warm, some erythema. You'll feel like a palpable cord. Uh, usually for my OSCEs for PA school, what we would do is I would actually bring a measuring type and then I would measure if I had a patient that had a DVT. I would measure the the calf and then compare it to the other calf to see if there was a difference in enlargement from each calf. So diagnosis for this patient is going to be Wells criteria. So basically if 
the patient, if you have a low probability that the patient has a DVT, get a D-dimer. If you have a very high probability that the patient has a DVT, then in these patients, you want to get a spiral CT, but the gold standard is going to be your venous angiogram. Treatment is going to be heparin, low molecular weight heparin, warfarin for three to six months, and then an IVC filter if needed. Uh, the complication of not treating your DVT is pulmonary embolism. That's why it's really important that we treat these DVTs. Also, DVTs are very common in patients that are post-surgery, especially your orthopedic surgeries. For example, if you had a patient that had hip surgery where these patients are immobilized for a really long time, it's very common in these patients. That's why it's important that we have these patients get up out of their bed and they're moving around. For example, for my rotation, most of our patients have burn burns and most of the burns that we see are in the lower extremities. Well, in the case that I've seen, and sometimes they're circumferential, so they involve the entire limb. And if these patients need surgery, if they have to go to surgery and they have to get grafting, so skin grafting to the burned area, they'll be in bed for a long time because it's painful. You have to wait for it to heal and they're having to change their wound care, etc. With these patients, though, we want to make sure that they're are getting up and moving out of bed. So rehab, which is composed of our physical therapist and occupational therapist, will work with us and the patients and we'll get them out of bed and have them walk around and making sure that they are moving their extremities to prevent these DVTs. Also, sometimes in the question stem, it'll say a woman that's on birth control, very commonly found in New York. Females that are on birth control, they're more prone to getting DVTs. Also, your pregnant females, pregnant woman and then also I've had questions where it was a woman and she was on a really long flight and she got home and she all of a sudden had this sudden acute pain on her right lower extremity on her calf and it was erythematous and it was inflamed etc so also patients that have been on really long car rides like I said really long trips overall they're more prone to getting DVTs and of course if they have any type of hypercoagulability disorder like protein C or protein S deficiency you want to think about these patients being more prone to getting DVTs. So now we're going to go, in, going to go into acute aneurysm. This is going to be an abnormal dilation in the aorta where it's 1.5 times larger than the normal size of an aorta. Usually this causes permanent dilation and there's a weakness in the vessel wall this, which causes increased diameter. The etiology is that 60% of the aortic aneurysms are in the abdominal area, 40% are in the thoracic, and it's usually due to arteriosclerosis, chronic hypertension, smokers. Smokers are a huge cause of aortic aneurysms, COPD, and more commonly found in your males and females, also patients that are older than 60. Also, if they have genetics, so a family member that has a history of aortic aneurysms, and also certain congenital disorders are more prone to getting aortic aneurysms, so how's this patient going to present? They're going to be presenting with abdominal symptoms like a pulsatile mass in the abdomen, severe constant abdominal pain that radiates to the back. This is like severe pain where the patient cannot just sit still. And usually it'll say a pulsatile mass in the abdomen, especially if it's an abdominal type of um, aortic aneurysm. Now, if it's a thoracic aortic aneurysm, usually these patients have no symptoms. If they do, they're going to have severe chest, back, or abdominal pain. They're going to have hoarseness, right, because you're having that compression of the recurrent laryngeal nerve. And then diagnosis for these aortic aneurysms in general is the first thing we want to do is an ultrasound. The definitive one, and to monitor these patients, it's going to be a CT scan, okay? And then also another thing that you need to know about aortic aneurysm is that for these patients, you want to screen any man over the age of 65 who has ever smoked in their lives. So we're always screening these patients. If it's a man greater than the age of 65 who has ever smoked. I had a question on, uh, I don't remember which exam it was, but it was a patient that came in, he was like 66, he was up to date on all his vaccinations. And then it asked you, what else do you want to offer to this patient? And he was a smoker. So in this case, you would offer him screening for aortic aneurysm. Treatment is depending on the size of the aneurysm. So if it's less than three centimeters, you really don't have to do anything. Just make sure that we observe it. Now, if it's three to four centimeters, we want to do an ultrasound every two to three years. If it's less than 4.5 centimeters, we want to do an ultrasound every six months. If it's 4.5 to five centimeters, we want to do an ultrasound every three to six months. And then if it's greater than 5.5 centimeters, we want to do surgery. 
So if it's less than three centimeters, once again, we don't really have to do anything. We just observe it. If it's greater than 5.5 centimeters, you want to do surgery. Another thing is that if you're monitoring these patients, for example, if we're doing that ultrasound every three to six months or every six months, and we see that it's one day, it's three, and the next day, next time you monitor them, it's like 4.5. Usually these patients do need surgery because that's an increased amount in a very short time in the diameter of the aorta, and these patients are more prone to getting rupture. So any huge jumps like that, if you have a question on that, just make sure that you go straight to surgery. Even if it's not greater than 5.5, if you've just been monitoring it and it does a huge jump, like it goes from 3 to 5, 1 to 3 or 1 to 4, then these patients need surgery because next time you see them, it's probably they're going to have a full-blown uh, aortic rupture. So now let's go into aortic dissection. So this is where the patient has a rupture of the vessel wall. It's fatal if there is no intervention. So these patients can bleed out. It's an emergency. It has a mortality of about 50%. And like we discussed early, typically, earlier, typically it occurs when the aortic aneurysm is greater than 5 centimeters, 5.5 centimeters. So how is this patient going to present? They're going to have severe abdominal pain that's radiating to the back. They'll have flank pain. You're going to feel a pulsatile mass with the heartbeat. They're going to be hypotensive. So hypotensive, they're going to have tachycardia, they're going to be syncopal, they're going to be passing out, losing consciousness, they're going to have this ripping, tearing pain. That's usually what you're going to see on your question is this ripping, tearing pain. So the triad is going to be your pain, hypotension, and pulsatile mass. So we have different types. We have the Stanford type A and the Stanford type B. Uh, they've also categorized them in different other types, but for this prep, for your exam, just make sure you know Stanford type A, Stanford type B. So Stanford type A is that it involves the ascending aorta. This is usually a surgical emergency because it's in the ascending aorta. So if we think about the aorta, it's like this, right? So this is going to be in the ascending aorta. Think about it as a candy cane. It's going to be the top of the candy cane. Now, Stanford type B, it's going to be in the descending aorta. Not quite as an emergency as Stanford type A. Stanford type A is more of a surgical emergency. Diagnosis is that first thing we want to do, if it asks you what's the next best step, you can do an ultrasound. The definitive diagnosis is going to be CT scan. You're going to see true lumen and false lumen with intimal flab. Measurements are taken from outer wall to outer wall. Treatment is that you want to support these patients hemodynamically, give them IV beta blockers, right, to decrease their, their um that blood flow, and then nitroprusside, you want to give them pain control, and they're going to have to have definitive treatment by going to the OR with the surgeon and repairing it. So another thing you need to know is coronary artery disease health maintenance is that in regards to blood pressure screening, we want to make sure that we know that according to the USPSTF guidelines, we start blood pressure screening at the age of 18. Also, with these patients, we usually give them aspirin, aspirin as a preventative. For patients that are older than 50 years old, that have greater than a 10% risk of having coronary artery disease or 10-year coronary vascular disease risk. Okay. And usually the dose is that we'll give them a low-dose aspirin, 81 milligrams PO once a day for 10 years in these patients. So it's going to valvular heart disease. It basically with all valvular heart disease, you're gonna have any, all of these results in retarded flow of the blood through the heart. So with these patients, you have different types. We have stenosis and regurgitation. Stenosis is when the valve does not open fully. It's hardened and it's more difficult to open. So less blood is able to pass through it. Regurgitation is when the valve does not close completely, and this leads to backflow and reduced preload. So S1 is when the AV valves close. S2 is when the semilunar valves close. Now, um, the best initial diagnostic test for any type of valvular heart disease is going to be with an echocardiogram but the most accurate is going to be a cardiac cath. So just make sure that you know that. So let's go into each one, the common ones that are gonna get tested on. Aortic stenosis is when the aortic valve does not open all the way or open easily. 
So yeah, reduce blood flow to the systemic system. This is going to be a systolic type of um you're gonna it's gonna be systolic it's gonna be systolic so etiology the most common cause is that it's very commonly found in your older patients because it's due to normal aging so just make sure that you know that for aortic stenosis it's usually going to be an older patient like 66 to 67 that's going to present with aortic stenosis it's usually due to mechanical stress over time very commonly found in patients older than 60 um, also commonly found in patients that have bicuspid valves or if they have chronic rheumatic fever. How is this patient going to present? Uh, the mnemonic I have is SAD, so it's going to be syncope, angina, and dyspnea. That's the mnemonic I have for aortic stenosis. So they're going to have syncope. Why? Because they have less flow to the brain. They can also present with chest pain, like we said, the angina, because they're going to have less flow to the coronary artery disease. Another thing that you'll hear or you'll read when you're studying for your exams for aortic stenosis is that they're going to have an ejection click. They're going to have this crescendo, decrescendo systolic murmur that radiates to the neck and the carotids. They'll have a paradoxical split S2. They'll have left ventricular hypertrophy, narrow pulse pressure, and decreased carotid pulses that decrease with Osalva, but they increase with squatting. Diagnosis is going to be with an echo, we can also do an EKG if the patient's presenting with chest pain. And treatment is usually valve replacement for these patients. That's like the best line treatment for them. Also, we want to make sure that we give these patients um, IV fluids and then have them consult with cardiology. And like we said, the definitive treatment is going to be your aortic valve replacement. So next one's going to be your aortic regurgitation. This is, like we discussed, insufficiency, where the blood flows back from the aorta into the left ventricle during diastole. So when there's ventricular uh, flow filling, the blood is flowing back from the left ventricle, left from the aorta into the left ventricle, and it's a type of diastolic. So with these patients, it's a type of diastolic murmur. So with these patients, uh, some of the etiologies is that the number one cause of aortic regurgitation is a patient that has long-standing hypertension. Other causes are, are aortic root dilation, whether it's due to aortic dissection and aneurysm or syphilis. Also, infective endocarditis can lead to aortic regurgitation. This patient is going to be presenting with decrescendo diastolic murmur. That's They're going to have increased systolic blood pressure and decreased diastolic blood pressure. They have bounding pulses, also known as your water hammer pulse. They'll have head bobbing, quick sign, which is when um, the fingers are pulsing and the nail bed changes to pale color. Diagnosis is going to be an echocardiogram and once again, chest pain. If they have chest pain, do an EKG. Treatment is going to be low sodium diet, put them on diuretics, and then valve replacement. It, you do that when the patient has a left ventricular ejection fracture of less than 55%. So let's go into mitral stenosis. This is where the valve does not open completely because there's fused leaflets and it's a diastolic type of murmur. The most common cause of mitral stenosis is going to be rheumatic fever. So any patient that has untreated group A beta hemolytic strep, so your strep throats, this can go to the heart and it can cause mitral uh, rheumatic fever, which in turn can cause mitral stenosis because we said that strep likes a mitral valve, right? Also, uh, mitral stenosis is very commonly found in your pregnant patients, your immigrants. Signs and symptoms. <clears throat> symptoms. This patient is going to present with edema and pulmonary congestion, a shortness of breath, dyspnea, dysphagia. They're going to have um, a snap and diastolic rumble that's heard best at the apex in the left lower uh, portion of the sternal border. They're going to have the Ortman sign, which is AFib plus hoarseness, which is occurred because there's compression of the recurrent laryngeal nerve. They'll have dyspnea and exertion and hemoptysis. Diagnosis is going to be with an echocardiogram, a cath. Um, we can also do an EKG, and then we'll see AFib on EKG because there's dilation of the left atrium. Treatment is going to be your low uh, sodium diet, diuretics like Lasix. We can also give them digoxin and warfarin for their AFib and then surgical if needed because we'll have to do a balloon valvoplasty or replacement of the mitral valve. 
And then the last one we have is going to be mitral regurgitation. This is where the valve does not shut all the way and it flows back into the atrium. There's dilation of the annular rings. This is a systolic type of murmur. Some of the causes of this is ischemia or previous myocardial infarction that causes dilation. Also, left side heart failure, rheumatic fever. The most common cause though, of mitral regurgitation is going to be your mitral valve prolapse. Make sure that you know this. Mitral valve prolapse is very commonly found in women, especially your young woman. Also, like your very young, skinny woman, sometimes like athletics. So usually in your question stem, it'll give you like a 30, 31 year old that's presenting with um, your click on your auscultation. So you want to think about mitral valve prolapse. So like we said, mitral valve prolapse is the most common cause of mitral regurgitation. So... Uh, with mitral valve prolapse, like we said, it's going to be a thin young woman who's anxious or depressed. Usually they're going to have Marfan syndrome or ehlers danlos syndrome. Some, in these patients, you want to think about mitral valve prolapse. With mitral valve prolapse, they're going to be presenting with a mid-systolic click and systolic murmur that radiates to the axilla with palpitations. Also with mitral valve prolapse, um, pre preload is increased whenever... The patient squats or raises their, their leg. The reason uh, why is because you're increasing preload. So when this happens, it's going to decrease the murmur, okay? Or whenever there is decreasing preload, which is when the patient is standing or they're doing a valsalva mover, this is going to increase the murmur for uh, mitral valve prolapse. So best diagnostic test for both mitral valve prolapse and then mitral regurgitation is going to be your echocardiogram. Uh, usually with mitral valve prolapse, we just observe these patients, but for mitral regurgitation, treatment's going to be valve repair or replacement. Um, if the patient does have like palpitations because they're having mitral valve prolapse, then you can do a beta blocker. All right, guys, so we are done with cardiology. Why don't we go into our next topic, which is going to be GI. So GI is going to be 10% of your exam. So esophagitis. Esophagitis is inflammation of the esophagus. The most common cause is going to be GERD. So gastroesophageal reflux disease, your heartburn, that's the most common cause. Other causes can be NSAIDs, alcoholism, radiation therapy, long-term antibody treatment, uh, advanced age or malnutrition. The most common cause of infectious esophagitis is going to be your candida alopans. The second most common cause of your infectious esophagitis is going to be your herpes simplex virus. This is very commonly found in your immunocompromised patients and also CMV or cytomegalovirus. Once again, very commonly found in your immunocompromised patients. So the patients that have like AIDS, HIV, kidney transplants. Pill esophagitis is usually due to prolonged contact with medications. The most common medications that cause pill esophagitis and you need to know this, it's going to be your biphosphonate, specifically your alendronate. That's why it's really important that you educate the, these patients that whenever they're taking a biphosphonate, that they have to make sure that they drink a full glass of water and they remain upright for at least 30 minutes whenever they take uh, a biphosphonate because we want to make sure we're preventing these things like pelosophagitis. Other medications are your tetracyclines. The other day I saw in EGD that was a child was complaining of like swallowing pain and you could see that he had a pill stuck and it was doxycycline. So tetracyclines are very commonly associated with pill esophagitis. Once again, educate your patients on drinking a full glass of water when they drink these antibiotics or just these medications in general. Other causes can be um, potassium chloride, ferrous sulfate, and then we have our, our xenophilic esophagitis. This is associated with allergic disorders. So they have usually an elevated serum IgE, and then you're going to see a stacked circular ring formation that is going to tell you that the patient has eosinophilic esophagitis. So these are going to be the most uh, common types of esophagitis that you're going to see on your exams. So in general for esophagitis, how are they going to present? They're going to present with odenophagia. So they're going to present with painful swallowing, okay, dysphagia, trouble swallowing, they're going to present him with chest pain, nausea and vomiting, cough. Sometimes they're asymptomatic, like candida. Sometimes they'll just look back there in the esophagus and you see like all this white stuff back there. And sometimes they'll have oral thrush, which is once again, candida. Sometimes you'll see oral ulcers, which you'll see herpes simplex virus. Diagnosis is gonna be with an endoscopy with biopsy and brushings. 
And if it's candida and you suspect candida, which is a yeast infection, right, you're going to see white cell circumscribed lesions, and they're going to be in creamy longitudinal plaques. Now, how is herpes simplex virus going to look? They're going to be white lesions within a central umbilical clearing. So they're both white. Just make sure that you know that herpes simplex virus is going to have white lesions with a central umbilical clearing, and candida is going to be white, white circumscribed lesions and their creamy longitudinal plaques. Treatment is protein pump inhibitors for esophagitis in general, especially since we said that the most common cause is going to be GERD. And tell the patient if it's due to GERD to avoid anything that can exacerbate their GERD. So spicy acidic foods, alcohol, tobacco, take small bites, stick with soft foods. If it's due to candida, which is a yeast infection like we discussed, you're going to give them fluconazole. If it's due to herpes simplex virus, we're going to give them the antivirals like acyclovir. And if it's due to suicidal megalovirus, which is CMV, which we said that we would suspect in a patient that's immunocompromised or if they had a kidney transplant, we're going to give them gangcyclovir. So Mallory Weiss tear. This is a superficial mucosal tear at or just below the gastroesophageal junction due to forceful vomiting and retching. Some of the causes of this is repeated episodes of vomiting, binge drinking, alcoholics, or eating disorders. Um, very commonly present with patients that have uh, hiatal hornea. And signs and symptoms, it's going to be hematemesis. The patient is going to present him with forceful vomiting with blood. So this patient's constantly vomiting that they cut, like they have a little, little cut on their esophagus versus your Borhav syndrome, which is like a complete like transmural, like you cut the entire esophagus. This is very, very deadly. Mallory Weiss is just like a small little cut and it's very painful. So it's usually due to those patients. Like sometimes you might find it in your anorexia or your bulimics, someone that's just been vomiting a lot. Usually on your question stem, it'll say like a person that was partying too hard or an alcoholic that they're just vomiting like all last night and then now they're presenting with like this um vomit with blood so it'll say hematemesis for these patients um i think we said binge drinking alcoholics or eating disorders so diagnosis is going to be an upper endoscopy um you also want to order blood type just in case if this patient has like a low hemoglobin and you have to transfuse like a pack of red blood cells treatment for this is that most of these usually stop bleeding without treatment, like about 90% within 24 hours. So you really don't have to do anything, just observe them. But uh, if needed, you can do surgical sew uh, sewing or angiographic embolization and then do some acid suppression, but usually they don't need treatment. So it's going to gastroesophageal reflux disease, which I have, it's like the worst. This is heartburn. It's due to inappropriate relaxation of the uh, lower esophageal sphincter, sphincter. So how I think about it, and this is how my pediatric doctor explained it to uh, one of his patients, because children have this also. So you have the esophagus, the esophagus opens into the stomach, right? The, um, the stomach. And then there, that's when you have, where you have the sphincter, it's like a little door. And that little door will open and close. So what happens with GERD is that you have um, an appropriate relaxation of that little door, that lower extremity, um, lower extremity sphincters, which is causing all these stomach contents to spill into the esophagus and is causing that irritation in these patients, in this case, in myself, because I suffer from this. And long-standing irritation can cause cancer in the future because the stomach and the cells in the stomach are prepared and they're created to manage all that acid. But the esophagus has different types of cells and tissue that are not prepared for that acid. So constant acid, constant acid can cause like cell changing in your esophagus or differentiation that can lead to different types of, that can lead to like adenocarcinoma of the esophagus, which we'll, we'll probably discuss later. So with GERD, and the etiology is that usually prevalence increases with age. Uh, usually these patients will present with a nocturnal cough and asthma. Um, some of the risk factors for these patients is that if they have decreased motility, gastric outlet obstruction, hiatal hernia, that's a sliding of perisophageal type of uh, hiatal hernias, 
dietary. So if they smoke, if they drink a lot of alcohol, if they eat a lot of coffee, drink a lot of coffee, I drink a lot of coffee. Uh, high fat. This patient is going to be presenting with a retro sternal chest pain that radiates upward. It's worse after eating and with lying down. They're going to have regurgitation, which is like the worst. Water brush, cough. I do have a cough. I have like this chronic cough. I always think I have COVID, but I don't. I just have like this chronic cough because of my GERD. Um, sore throat, which is what I get a lot. Um, dyspepsia. Diagnosis is usually a clinical diagnosis. The patient will just tell you their symptoms and you can associate this with GERD. Treatment is usually an empiric trial with PPIs if needed. Um, you can then do an endoscopy with a biopsy. This is usually the test of choice, but the gold standard is going to be 24 pH, 24 hour pH monitoring. So if it asks you what's a gold standard, it's going to be 24 hour pH monitoring for GERD. Treatment is initially, once again, like we said, it's going to be all lifestyle modifications. So in these patients, we want to avoid any type of fatty foods, coffee, alcohol, or induce chocolate, large meals before going to sleep. Uh, sleeping with the trunk elevated, tell the patients to stop smoking. If they're overweight, tell them to lose weight because this is another thing that can cause their GERD. So if we need to give medications, the initial treatment is going to be with your antacid or H2 blockers. Make sure that you know that even though in clinic, I rarely see patients get started on H2 blockers. We usually start straight on PPIs. For textbook wise, it's always going to be your H2 blockers, which you're going to start with and or antacids always start with those now say that they've tried that then you can move on to ppis or if they want something stronger ppis but usually textbook it's going to be your h2 blockers and your antacids according to your questions but in real life really no really jump to the ppis so if needed you can do surgery like nissen fundiplication but we usually don't do this because it's not very effective but if the patient has tried medications and it's severe and it's still not going away and they want to do surgery, then you can consider Neeson fund application. Complications of GERD is erosive esophagitis, strictures, esophageal ulcers, Barrett's esophagus, pitting of the dental enamel, gingivitis, laryngitis, and pharyngitis. I had a patient during my family medicine rotation that she had severe GERD since she was a child. And it was so bad that she needed to get all of her teeth. She needed to get new teeth because she said her teeth were just like eroding and they would just like fall off. And when I saw her, she had like a, like fake teeth. And that scared me. It scared me a lot because like I said, I suffer from GERD. And it's very, very painful. You get that retrosternal chest pain. You get that like, like that burning sensation. You can't eat anything spicy, which I love spicy foods. So gastritis is going to be the next one. This is going to be an inflammation of the stomach epithelium. Uh, usually there's acute, chronic, erosive, and non-erosive gastritis. It's usually secondary to an inflammatory response. The most common cause of acute gastritis is going to be your helicobacter pylori infection or your H. pylori infection. This is a bacteria that lives in the stomach and it likes to live there. Not a lot of bacteria can live in the environment of the stomach because the stomach is very, very acidic. And this is the only bacteria that likes to live there in the stomach. So this is H. pylori. It's the most common cause of gastritis, most common cause of GERD. It's just really bad. So other causes of gastritis can be inflammation, whether the patient's been taking a lot of NSAIDs or they use a lot of alcohol. Chronic type A is... Um, Pernicious anemia, and then you have your chronic type B, which is usually due to H. pylori. So signs and symptoms, this patient's going to be presenting with dyspepsia, anorexia, epigastric pain, nausea and vomiting, GI bleeds. Diagnostics, we're going to do an H. pylori test, so we're going to look at their urea breath test. We'll do an EGD with biopsy. And treatment is uh, symptomatic. Basically, you give them antiemetics, H2 or PPI inhibitors. Make sure that they're eating a lot of fluids. And then lifestyle modifications, right? Tell them to stop taking any NSAIDs if they're, have, if they're taking NSAIDs chronically. Tell them to stop smoking. Tell them to do stop drinking alcohol and to change their diet. And then we want to treat the underlying cause. Like we said, the most common cause is going to be H. pylori. This is very tested, so make sure you know this. How do you treat H. pylori? You're going to do a PPI plus macrolide plus amoxicillin. So it's usually something like 
um, omeprazole plus clarithromycin plus amoxicillin. And that's going to be the treatment for H. pylori. The complications of gastritis is that it can cause pernicious anemia. Um, this is due to parietal cell destruction. And we want to make sure that we supplement these patients with uh, vitamin B12. So gastroenteritis is going to be the next one. Gastroenteritis is also known as your stomach flu. Uh, basically, these patients will present with diarrhea that is abnormally frequent and liquidy due to infection or inflammation of the intestine. Some of the etiologies of this are viruses, like your rotavirus, bacterial causes are E. coli, which is the most common one because E. coli is found in the gut, C. diff, Salmonella, Shigella, Vibrio. If it's parasitic, we want to think about uh, Giardia lamnia. So uh, Giardia is when it causes like those fatty stools and the patient's been outside drinking water from a river or they're a camper and they were drinking water from a stream. Um, that's uh, Giardia, so Giarditis also. Other causes is that it can be spread from person from person for food or water. This patient is going to be presenting with diarrhea, fever, lethargy, abdominal pain, vomiting, and dehydration. If it's due to a viral cause, they're going to have watery stools, no blood or mucus. If it's bacterial, though, they're going to have mucoid stools and bloody stools. This patient is going to be diagnosed by electrolytes. Uh, you're going to look at their BUN and creatinine, their urine analysis, stool specimen if needed. You're going to look at the mucus and blood. These patients are usually going to be metabolic acidotic, right? Because they're going to have diarrhea. Metabolic alkalosis is vomiting. Metabolic acidosis is diarrhea. They're going to be hyponatremic because most of these patients are going to be dehydrated since they have so much diarrhea. That's why we're checking their electrolytes because they might have electrolyte imbalances because they're so dehydrated once again because everything's coming out. And treatment for this is usually self-limited supportive. We're going to give them oral uh, rehydration if they can support it. We want to correct their electrolyte abnormalities since most of these patients, we said they were going to be metabolic acidotic, hyponatremic because we're having all this diarrhea. We're going to give them something like ondansetran or phenergan for their emesis since they're going to be vomiting a lot. And some of the complications of gastroenteritis are dehydration and hypovolemic shock. So let's go into peptic ulcer disease. So Peptic ulcer disease is the most common cause of upper GI bleeding. Once again, the most common cause of peptic ulcer disease is going to be your H. pylori. NSAIDs, what happens is that you have different types. You have gastric ulcers and your duodenal ulcers. Other causes of um, peptic ulcer disease is going to be acid hypersecretory states like Sollinger-Ellison syndrome, smoking, alcohol, coffee, emotional stress, diet. And like we said, the most the two common ones are going to be your gastric and duodenal ulcers. The thing you need to know about these is how are they going to present? Which one is going to get better with food? Which one is going to get worse with food? How I memorize it is that dude, give me food. So duodenal gets better with food. Gastric gets worse with food. So dude, give me food. Duodenal gets better with food. Um, gastric gets worse with food. So gastric ulcers, like we said, get worse with food. And these are more likely to be malignant, and they're more commonly found in older patients and patients that have NSAIDs, and also for and patients that have type A blood, which is interesting. For your duodenal ulcers, like we discussed, it's pain that's really with eating, more likely to have nocturnal pain, younger patients smoking, and usually type O blood. This patient is going to be presenting with epigastric pain that's aching and gnawing. They'll have nocturnal symptoms, nausea and vomiting, weight loss. They'll have early satiety, so they get full very, very easily. If it's perforated, they'll have right shoulder pain, rebound uh, tenderness, and diagnosis, we're going to do an endoscopy with a biopsy. And this is usually the gold standard because we want to rule out any type of malignancy. We're also going to do a urea breath test or a fecal antigen test for these patients because we want to rule out um, your H. pylori and serology because this is um, the most common cause like we discussed, and it's the easiest one to do. And treatment for these patients is that we want to discontinue whatever is causing it. So if they're on NSAIDs and they've been taking NSAIDs for a while, to discontinue that. We want to tell them to restrict alcohol intake, decrease your stress, do not smoke, don't eat before going to bed. We can give them acid suppression, once again, your H2 blockers or your PPIs, antacids, 
And if it's H. pylori, we're going to treat it, right? We have the triple treatment, like we said, or PPIs like omeprazole, amoxicillin, and clarithromycin. You can also do the quadruple treatment for H. pylori, which is going to be your PPI, bismuth, metronidazole, and tetracycline. And we can also give them something like sucrophate and misoprosol, which are cytoprotectant. And if it's a ruptured peptic ulcer, we're going to give them IV antibiotics and PPIs prior to surgical repair. So diverticulitis. Diverticulitis is an inflammation of the diverticulum, uh, usually due to feces that gets impacted in that diverticulum. Um, sometimes erosion or microperforations can cause diverticulitis, and the most common site it's going to be the left lower quadrant. So with diverticulitis, the most common cause is going to be diverticulosis, right? So diverticulosis is where you have your colon. It's usually due to like increased pressure or sometimes wear and tear in your your tissues as we get older, our tissues aren't as, I would say, like strong like they used to be. So they get more prone to getting perforated, more prone to getting things like your colon, like things like diverticulosis, which is where you have like these kind of like outbeddings in the colon, especially like in the descending colon. That's why it's more commonly found in the left lower quadrant pain. That's where the patient's going to be complaining of. So you're going to have all these, you have a lot of pressure that goes through and with time, the tissue gets really, really weak and it causes like these like little bubbles, which is diverticulosis. And usually a patient can have diverticulosis and they don't know they have it. But what happens is that sometimes as your stool is moving down your colon right to your rectum, that still can get stuck in that diverticulum. And sometimes what does bacteria like? Bacteria likes anywhere that causes, anywhere there's stasis. So if there's something staying there for a long time, it's a great environment for the bacteria. And so that's why we, what causes diverticulitis is that this bacteria can go to this diverticulum that has this feces. It's a great environment for them. And this is what causes diverticulitis. And sometimes it can perforate, which can cause peritonitis, which is more severe. And that's why it's very commonly found in your older patients, um, diverticulosis, diverticulitis, because it's wear and tear, basically. So with diverticulitis, um, some of the etiology is that usually the most, most of the cases of diverticulitis are uncomplicated. Um, if they are complicated, sometimes they can present with an abscess formation, colovesical fistula obstruction, or free colonic perforation. Like we said, it can cause peritonitis if it perforates. If that bacteria gets into the abdominal cavity, this patient's going to be presenting with fever, left lower quadrant pain, leukocytosis. Whenever I think about left lower quadrant pain, I think about anything associated with the colon especially if it's an older patient and they tell you that they have a history of diverticulosis, you want to think about diverticulitis. Um, they won't have any bleeding though. They'll have constipation. They can present with diarrhea, but it's more constipation than anything than diarrhea. They're going to have nausea and vomiting. They'll have this painful mass, scarring, rigidity, rebound, tenderness. You're going to do a CT scan with oral and IV contracts. That's where you're going to see a swollen and edit edematous Edematous bowel wall or abscess. And then on abdominal x-ray, um, you can also do. And what's contraindicating is putting anything through the rectum. So we don't want to do in these patients a um, colonoscopy. In these patients, we don't want to do a very enema because this can cause perforation. And perforation can cause peritonitis. We want to avoid this. It's contraindicated in patients with diverticulitis. Treatment's going to be with your IV antibiotics, bowel rest, give them nothing by mouth, IV fluids, making sure that they give, that they take a lot of fiber. That way it's going to help with the bowel, right? It's going to help the bowel move more smoothly through the colon. And then surgical resection for recurrent episode. And then surgical resection for recurrent episodes or complications. So let's go into the next one, pseudomembranous colitis. This is going to be an inflammation of the colon that's due to bacteria, uh, like C. difficile. This is going to be diagnosed is that you're going to see uh, yellow slash white plaques in the intestinal mucosa that are made of fibrin. Some of the causes of pseudomembranous colitis, the most common cause is going to be a recent antibiotic use and your antibiotics that are known for causing C. diff, C. diff and that's why it's really important that we're careful with these medications 
and we're not prescribing them to everyone, it's going to be your clindamycin and fluoroquinolones. These are very commonly associated with pseudomembranous colitis. Also, if the patient has recent hospitalization, if they're older or if they're using any type of PBIs, because PBIs, what do they do? They decrease the amount of acid that your stomach produces. And acid, it does also protect you from certain bacterial infections. So if you have decreased acid, it can make you more prone to getting bacterial infections like uh, C. diff. How is this patient going to present? Fever, frequent watery stools, crampy abdominal pain, dehydration, abdomen that is tender to palpation. Diagnosis, we're going to do an x-ray. Uh, we're going to do a CT scan. On your CT scan, you're going to see an accordion sign. And then we can also do stool cytotoxin studies and then an ELISA test. Treatment is that if they have a mild to moderate pseudomembranous colitis, we're going to do oral metronidazole. If it's severe, then we're going to give them oral vancomycin. If it's recurrent, then we're going to give them vancomycin for 10 days. Okay, guys, so let's go into our herbal bowel disease. What you need to know about this one is that it comes into in two different flavors. So you have your ulcerative colitis and you have your Crohn's disease. With these two, you need to know which one causes rectal bleeding, which one involves the transmural portion of the um, tissue, which one only involves the submucosa and the mucosa, which one is treated by, you can have a curative treatment with surgery, okay, and then which one is found, for example, anywhere in the GI system from the mouth to the rectum to anywhere and which one's only found in the rectum and the colon. So this is what you need to do when you're differentiating between these two. So let's get into each one. The first one's going to be ulcerative colitis. Ulcerative colitis is a chronic inflammation and ulcers of the colon and rectal mucosa. It tends to involve the mucosa and the submucosa. The patient has a continuous inflammation. Some of the etiology of this is that it involves the rectum in all the cases like we discussed, and the patient has periodic exacerbations and remissions. The thing about this one is that smoking is a protective factor. Of course, we're not going to go tell these patients to go and smoke. And if you're a fan of Dr. House, there's an episode where there's a patient that presents with um, your ulcerative colitis and the doctor, Dr. House, literally grabs a notepad and he writes smoking as a prescription for it. Of course, we don't do that in real life, but smoking is a protective factor for ulcerative colitis. Very commonly found in your adolescents, your young adults, this patient is going to be presenting with abdominal pain. They're going to have left lower quadrant pain, also diarrhea. Uh, they're going to have hematochoesia, which is going to be your gross blood. They'll have small frequent bowel movements, fever, anorexia, weight loss, tenesmus. So tenesmus is that rectal heaving. They'll also have extra intestinal symptoms like jaundice, uveitis, pyoderma gangrenosum, erythema nodosum, ankylosing spondylitis, renal stones, liver disease. The diagnosis, the definitive diagnosis is going to be with your sigmoidoscopy and colonoscopy because in these patients, you're able to look and see what area is affected because we said that ulcerative colitis tends to involve usually like the rectum and parts of the colon versus your Crohn's disease. It's found anywhere from the mouth to anywhere in the GI system. And that's how you're able to differentiate between both of these. And like we discussed also, this one only involves the mucosa and the submucosa of the intestine versus your Crohn's disease. It's a transmural, so it involves everything. So um, another thing that you need to know about this is that usually we want to make sure that we avoid sigmoidoscopies and colonoscopies in acute flare-ups. Why? Because there's a risk of perforation. And labs, we're going to see anemia in these patients. We're going to have an increased ESR. We can do an abdominal x-ray. We're going to see colonic dilation. But usually the definitive diagnostic test is going to be your sigmoidoscopy and colonoscopy. So treatment for this is going to be surgery. It's going to be the definitive curative treatment for these patients, a total colectomy. And in ulcerative colitis, this is only the only part. These are the only type of patients where you can treat them with surgery. Because with your Crohn's, your Crohn's disease, like we discussed, it's found from the mouth to anywhere in the GI system. We can't treat this with surgery versus ulcerative colitis, since it's very commonly found in the rectum. We can treat this with, with surgery.
a colectomy. So what if the patient is having an acute exacerbation? You can treat it with systemic steroids. Maintenance is usually going to be with mesalamine or sulfazalazine. Complications is that this is that these patients have iron deficiency anemia. They can suffer from hemorrhages, electrolyte disturbances, dehydration, seizures. Toxic megacolon is a big one. This is very highly tested, so make sure that you know that ulcerative colitis is associated with toxic megacolon and then increased colon cancer risk for any type of patient that has aerial bowel disease. So now let's go into Crohn's disease. So Crohn's disease is an inflammation and tissue destruction that occurs anywhere in the GI tract, like we discussed. It's a destruction of the entire depth of the intestinal wall. So this is going to be transmural. Once again, this is how you differentiate between your ulcerative colitis. Ulcerative colitis usually involves the colon and the rectum, and this is only involves mucosa and the submucosa versus Crohn's. It's transmural inflammation, and it's found anywhere in the GI tract, from the mouth to the rectum, anywhere. So with these patients, the most common location of Crohn's, it's going to be in your terminal ileum. This is very highly testable. Make sure you know that terminal ileum. Rarely in the stomach and then in the mouth and the esophagus, but very commonly found in the terminal ileum. This is very commonly found in your young women between the ages of 15 to 35, your Caucasians, and your Jewish individuals. How is this patient going to present? They're going to present with flares and remissions, right lower quadrant pain, nausea and vomiting, diarrhea, but they're not really going to have any gross blood versus your ulcerative colitis. They are going to have gross blood. They'll present with fever, malaise, malabsorption, weight loss. This patient's going to be presenting with flares and remissions like we discussed. So also make sure you know that. They'll also have extra intestinal symptoms like jaundice, uveitis, pyoderma gangrenosum, erythema nodosum, ankylosing spondylitis, renal stones, liver disease also. Diagnosis is going to be with an endoscopy with a biopsy. And then another thing that you're going to see is that you're going to see cobblestone appearance. Cobblestone appearance is usually pathognomonic for your ulcerative colitis. You'll also see at this ulcerous skip lesions, anal fissures, Another way you can diagnose them is that you can do a barium on enema, CT angiography, pill cam if needed, but usually with endoscopy with biopsy. <clears throat> that's where you'll see your cobblestone appearance and then your skipped lesions, right? Because we said it's found anywhere in the body, in the GI system. So treatment, we cannot do surgery with these patients because it's not curative because like we discussed, it's found anywhere in the GI tract. Medications we can give, and the one that's very highly tested that I keep seeing is mesalamine. You can also give sulfazalazine, uh, metronidazole. Also, if the patient is not responding to your mesalamine, if the patient is having an acute flare up, you can do systemic corticosteroids like prednisone. And complications of this, since it is transmural and it involves the entire intestinal wall, with these patients, they can develop a fistula. A small bowel obstruction, malignancy, malabsorption, like vitamin B12 deficiency, cholelithiasis, nephrolithiasis, toxic megacolon, and narcotic abuse because these patients are in so much pain. So like we discussed, make sure that you know that you are able to differentiate between both of them. Like we discussed, irritable bowel disease. You have two flavors. You have your Crohn's, and then you also have your ulcerative colitis. So with ulcerative colitis, these patients are more prone to presenting with dyskesia, right? So hematochesia, which is going to be your blood in your stool. This is going to involve the submucosa and the mucosa only. With these patients, a colectomy is the best definitive treatment for these patients. And then you have your Crohn's disease. This is a transmural, so involves the entire you know, intestinal wall. And with these patients, uh, treatment for this, we cannot do surgery. We usually tend to give them medications like mesalamine. And like we said, it's a transmural, so it involves everything. It's skip lesions. You'll see those cobblestone appearance also. And then it involves anywhere from the mouth to the GI. So now let's get into the next topic, which is going to be small bowel obstruction. So small bowel obstruction. What is the etiology of small bowel obstruction? Uh, dehydration. The most common, though, cause in adults, it's going to be your surgical adhesions. So it's going to be a patient that just had surgery or that had surgery a while back, and now they're presenting with a bowel obstruction. Other causes can be incarcerated hernias. This is actually the second most common cause 
also malignancy. Other causes of this are prioritization, foreign bodies, signs and symptoms, cramping, abdominal pain, nausea and vomiting, obstipation, which basically means absence of gas, distension, normal or increased bowel sounds. And another thing with these patients is that if it's strangulated, this patient is going to present a little bit more uh, severe. So this is, they're going to present with severe pain, hematemesis, which is vomiting blood, shock, gas in the bowel wall or portal vein, free abdominal air, peritoneal signs, and then acidosis also. Diagnosis, we can do this with an x-ray and it's, inv it's least invasive and it's quick. And we're going to see dilated loops with minimal gas. You'll have that ladder pattern. You can also do a barium enema to see if there's any site of obstruction. And then your upper GI series is usually going to show you a string of pearls. Treatment, uh, usually non-operative. Uh, we treat these patients with IV fluids with potassium to restore urine output and correct hypokalemia. We can also do an NG tube um, to empty out the stomach and then, of course, antibiotics. Now, if a patient needs surgeries, then surgical indications are persistent or suspected strangulation laparotomy with lysis of adhesions and resection of the necrotic bowel. So toxic megacolon. Toxic megacolon is a dilation and widening of the colon where that causes swelling and inflammation to the deep layers of the colon. It's severe, it's rare, and it's very life-threatening. Some of the etiologies of this is Hirschsprung's disease. So Hirschsprung's disease is basically an aganglionic colon that's not working, it's just there. So can you imagine just stasis and bacteria that can cause this toxic megacolon. Also Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, C. diff infections, ischemic colon cancer and diabetes. So remember we discussed earlier that irritable bowel disease is commonly associated with toxic megacolon. It can develop into that complication. Other, other signs and symptoms for these patients, they're gonna be presenting with abdominal pain, bloating. It's, they're gonna have abdominal distension, fever, tachycardia, leukocytosis, abnormal bowel sounds, diarrhea. And we can diagnose this with an abdominal x-ray. Usually what you're gonna see on your exams is that you're gonna see loss of hostra markings. Okay, so loss of hostra markings. Sometimes I'll just give you an x-ray and you'll see this really, really large bowel. And the hostras are usually what you'll see if you were to draw a bowel, right, you draw it like this. On an x-ray, you're not going to see that. That's why it's called loss of a hostra sign. So that's really pathognomonic for your toxomegacolon, so loss of hostra markings. Treatment is bowel decompression with an NG2 fluid and electrolyte replacement, corticosteroids and antibiotics. If the patient is not improving after 24 hours and you've done all this or they're worsening, then you might have to go in there and do a colectomy. Complications of this is perforation, blood loss, sepsis, and shock. So next topic is going to be your acute mesenteric ischemia. So this is where there is reduced blood supply to the colon and parts of the bowel wall that causes necrosis. This is life-threatening, and it's usually due to superior um, mesenteric artery that is involved. So there's four types of acute mesenteric ischemia. You have three arterial and then one venous. The mortality rate for these patients is 60 to 70%, and then bowel infarction, which means is that the bowel is not working, is about 90%. How I think about acute mesenteric ischemia, it's like a heart attack, but of the, um, the abdominal area. So the different types we have are arterial embolism. This is about the most common cause of acute mesenteric ischemia. It's about 50%. They're all from cardiac origin, so your atrial fibrillation, your myocardial infarction, your vascular diseases, and symptoms tend to be more sudden and painful. You also have, also have arterial thrombosis, which is about 25%. With these patients, they tend to have atherosclerotic disease at other sites, which causes acute occlusion, so this causes low cardiac output, pla plaque rupture, and it's a gradual pain. It's less severe with these patients. And then we have non-occlusive mesenteric ischemia. This is about 20%. They have splanchnic vasoconstriction that's secondary to low cardiac output. It's very commonly found in your critically ill elderly patients. And then you have your venous thrombosis. This is about 10% of acute mesenteric ischemia. These patients usually present because of infection. They have hypercoagulable dis dis um, states or disorders. 
They'll be on oral contraceptives, they'll have portal hypertension, malignancy, or pancreatitis. So in general, how is the patient going to present with acute mesenteric ischemia? They're going to have severe abdominal pain that's disproportionate to the physical exam findings. They're going to have anorexia, vomiting, mild GI bleeding, peritonitis, sepsis, shock. They'll have intestinal uh, infarction symptoms, and usually these symptoms are like hypotensive, uh, tachypnea, lactic acidosis, fever, ultramental status, because these patients are crashing, right? And diagnosis is that we're going to do a mesenteric angiography. We can also do a barium enema, and we're going to see the thumb fronting sign. We want to do a lactate level also, which is usually going to be increased, right, because you have tissue death in these patients. So once again, acute mesenteric ischemia is where there's some type of clot that lodges in any of the vessels that are supplying blood to your intestines. So what happens, it's like a heart attack, right? If there's a clot that's big enough and it gets stuck in the vessels, then you're going to have decreased blood flow to your um, intestinal areas. And this is an emergency because the tissue can die. It can become necrotic. So treatment is supportive. Usually we want to give IV fluids, broad antibiotics, surgical resection, only if like peritonitis develops in these patients. And if it's an arterial cause, we can give them vasodilators like IV papaverin. If it's an embolic cause of acute mesenteric ischemia, then we can do thrombolytics or an embolectomy. And if it's a venous cause, then we're going to do heparin. So next topic we're going to go into is acute appendicitis. Make sure you know this because you are definitely going to have a question on acute appendicitis. This is an inflammation of the appendix that causes it's caused usually by obstruction of the lumen that leads to stasis and bacterial growth. So with acute appendicitis, you need to know that it's very commonly found in your males, more males and female. And the ages range tends to be between 10 to 30. Uh, the peak incidence is between teens to mid-20s. And there's numerous causes of appendicitis. The most common cause in your adults is going to be a fecalis, so... A piece of feces or poop gets stuck in the appendix. The appendix starts getting enlarged, inflamed, and it can rupture and cause peritonitis. So that's why it's an emergency and these patients need to get their appendix out because we want to prevent that peritonitis and all that bacteria getting in the abdominal cavity and making the patient get septic. Other causes of this is going to be undigested seeds, pinworm infections. That's gross, right? And the most common cause in children is usually lymphoid hyperplasia, so overgrowth of the tissue. This patient's going to be presenting with your right lower quadrant abdominal pain, so appendicitis, right lower quadrant abdominal pain. And usually with, these pa with this pain, it's going to start at the epigastrin, and then it's going to move towards the umbilicus and then the right lower quadrant area. Or sometimes it'll just say it started in the umbilicus and then it moved to the right lower quadrant pain. So uh, this patient's going to be presenting with abdominal distension, sharp pain. They'll see that they're anorexic. They'll have nausea and vomiting. And then make sure you know these signs. They're very, very highly tested. So the first one that you need to know is that the patient's going to be tender to palpation at the McBurney's point. Don't confuse this with the Murphy sign. Murphy sign is for your cholecystitis because I used to confuse these all the time. McBurney's point is for your appendicitis. So they're going to be tender to palpation in the right lower quadrant area. So right lower quadrant pain tenderness is going to be your McBurney's point. These patients are going to have a positive Rothstein sign. So a Rothstein sign is when you place or you place, basically it's going to be painful whenever you touch the left lower quadrant. So if you place pressure on the left lower quadrant, it's going to, they're going to feel pain in the right lower quadrant. And that's going to be your Rothstein sign. And then you have your psoas sign. That's when you lift up the right lower extremity and the patient's going to have pain because it's pulling on the psoas muscle that's irritated because of the appendicitis. So you're just going to elevate it. You're going to tell the patient to elevate against pressure resistance and this is going to be the psoas sign. It's going to be elevating that right lower extremity, that right leg against uh, your resistance. And then the obturator sign uh, that's when you, this is when it's very complicated, you just kind of go in like that and out. 
and it's going to be very, very painful also for these patients. So make sure you know how to differentiate these. Uh, the most common one is going to be definitely your McBurney's point, which is going to be tenderness to palpation at the right lower quadrant pain area. This patient is also going to be presenting with guardian, diminished bowel sounds, low grade fever. Diagnosis is usually clinical. Um, we can do a CBC and we might see mild leukocytosis. You can also do a UA, but usually it's not needed. The best test is usually going to be your ultrasound. You want to make sure that you limit radiation, but of course, if the patient is obese or sometimes you cannot see with an ultrasound, then you can do a CT scan, but ultrasound is going to be the best initial one. Treatment is going to be appendectomy, right? You're going to go in there, do a laparoscopically, and remove the appendix. So next one's going to be your anal fissures. This is going to be a tear of the anal canal below the dentate line. It's the most common benign anal rectal disease, and it's the most common cause of anal pain and bleeding. Uh, very commonly found in your infants, middle-aged adults also, in the most common location. This one's very highly tested, so make sure that you know this. Is going to be posterior midline of the anal canal. Once again, most common location of an anal fissure is going to be the posterior midline of the anal canal. It's usually due to local trauma, so large stools, childbirth, anal sex, um, use of cathartics. And then there's secondary causes like Crohn's, tuberculosis, sarcoidosis, leukemia, HIV, syphilis, chlamydia. It's usually when we suspect a Secondary cause tends to be associated with more malignancies than anything. This patient is going to be presenting with rectal pain at rest. It's going to be severe pain that is exacerbated with defecation, anal bleeding, hematochoesia. They tend to avoid going to the restroom because it's very, very painful. And there's you have your acute and chronic uh, anal fissure. So acute anal fissure is going to be any uh, anything that's lasting less than eight weeks and then chronic greater than eight weeks. Usually with your chronic, you have your triad of fissures, skin tags, and then they'll have hypertrophy papillae. On physical exam, you want to avoid any type of invasive maneuver, so you don't want to put anything in there. You usually will place the patient in a prone jackknife position. I know that sounds like very like intense, but you're going to place the patient in a prone jackknife position. You're going to spread the gluteal cheeks and then look in the posterior midline. Diagnosis, you really don't have to see the anal fissure itself to diagnose it. Um, and we really rarely ever perform a DRE or an endoscopy because it's very, very painful for these patients. So it's usually like a clinical diagnosis. Uh, treatment is, these tend to go away by themselves. Just make sure that you educate the patient on increasing their fiber their diet, sits baths, analgesics like lidocaine and stool softeners. Uh, we can place the patient on laxatives. Second line is like topical nitroglycerin. And say the patient has tried all this and they keep getting them and they're repeated. The patient can do Botox. So we can also do surgery like a sphincterotomy. And if it's a chronic one, like we said, we want to make sure that we evaluate any other secondary cause like Crohn's, leukemia, HIV, syphilis, etc. So make sure that you know this one, this one's very highly tested. So once again, anal fissures are the most common cause of anal pain and bleeding in these patients. They're going to be presenting with severe pain that's exacerbated with defecation. The most common location is going to be posterior midline of the anal canal. And usually with these patients, just make sure you, that you educate them on increasing their fiber diet. So remember how we discussed usually when it tells you what's the first line treatment. You want to make sure that you always choose something that's not pharmacological, something that they can change, the lifestyle changes. And this is an example. So the patient's going to, you're going to educate them on increasing their high fiber diets and then also tell them to do sit spats. All right. Anal rectal abscess or fistula. So this is an infection of the anal spaces. Uh, for a fistula, it's a connection between two epithelial surfaces. The most common site is going to be the posterior rectal wall. Some of the causes of this is bacterial infection of the blo blocked anal gland. So bacteria that involve, are involved in your anal abscesses are going to be your E. coli, usually the most common one because E. coli is usually your big bug that's found in the GI. Other causes can be proteus, strep, staph, bacteroides, anaerobes, um, anal fissures and Crohn's can also lead to your 
uh, abscesses and fistulas. For fistula, it tends to be associated with an abscess, usually at the internal os at the dentate line. And how is this patient going presenting with if they have an anal abscess or a fluctuant, fluctuant fistula? They're going to be presenting with rectal pain that's worse with sitting, coughing, defecating, throbbing pain, erythema, swelling, usually for an anal rectal abscess. If it's a fistula, they're going to be presenting with purulent drainage, itching, tender. And diagnosis for both is just uh, doing an external perianal exam. If needed, we can do a DRE. If it's an abscess, we usually just treat that with incision and drainage. It's, if it's an idiopathic fistula, we just do surgical incision and excision under anesthesia. If it's a complex fistula, then you're going to do a fistulotomy. You're going to put usually a biprosthetic plug in there. And then pillonidal disease. Pillonidal disease in acute abscess or draining sinus in the sacrococcygeal area secondary to obstruction of a hair follicle. Usually these patients are asymptomatic. They don't even know they have it until it becomes infected. Uh, when it does come infected, the treatment for this is going to be incision and drainage. They'll have to go to surgery and get a, a pilonidal cystotomy or excision of the sinus tract and cyst marsupialization. These are very, very painful. Hemorrhoids. So you have different types of hemorrhoids. You have internal or external hemorrhoids. You need to know the anatomy of this and which ones are painless and which ones are painful. So this, for hemorrhoids, it involves the varicose veins of the anus and the rectum. So for external, there's dilated veins that are arising from the inferior hemorrhoid plexus. So these are going to be distal to the dentate line and these are going to be painful. So once again, external, distal to the dentate line, they're going to be painful. Versus your internal, they're dilated submucosal veins of the superior rectal plexus, because that makes sense, right? Internal, superior to the rectal plexus. External, inferior to the rectal plexus. And these are going to be above the dentate line, and these are going to be painless. So risk factors for this is going to be um, constipation, straining, pregnancy, portal hypertension, obesity, prolonged sitting or standing, anal intercourse, this patient is going to be presenting with bleeding rectal prolapse. They're going to have bright red blood in the toilet bowl or on the toilet paper. Sometimes they can even coat the stool, the blood. And if the patient has an external hemorrhoid, they're going to be presenting with a sudden painful perianal swelling that's worse with defecation, and you'll see a tender palpable mass. Versus internal, usually these patients are asymptomatic and they have painless bleeding. Diagnosis is going to be visual inspection with the DRE, and uh, we can also do a fecal occult blood test if needed. Treatment, if it's non-thrombosed, if it's not purple and swollen, with these patients, we can just do sitz baths, give them stool softeners, tell them to, once again, increase their fiber, increase their fluid intake. You can also prescribe something like a topical hydrocortisone, and then last line would be a hemorrhoidectomy if needed. So once again, the treatment for these is going to be something that's non-invasive, right? Lifestyle changes. So educating them on the importance of increasing their fluid intake, increasing their fiber and their diet. And then for internal, um, we can do rubber band ligation. If it's thrombosed or if it's clotted, we can do an initial elliptical excision, usually done within 72 hours. You um, do this. So... Next topic is going to be cholangitis. Cholangitis is an infection of the biliary tract that's secondary to obstruction. What happens is that you get biliary stasis, bacterial overgrowth, and this is life-threatening. This is an emergency. So the most common cause of cholangitis is cholelithiasis. And what happens is that you have a bacterial infection with E. coli. So if we think about our, our anatomy, right? Uh, we have cholelithiasis, which just means gallstones in the gallbladder we have the gallbladder here we have the liver here right gallbladder and we have the liver here and then from the gallbladder you have your cystic duct and then the cystic duct is going to join with the duct that comes down from the liver so it's going to join with your hepatic duct they're both going to join together and it's going to form the common bile duct which you're going to go and drain into the small intestine so what happens is that sometimes these gallstones that are in the gallbladder, they come out, they get, they go down the cystic duct, 
and then you have flu that's going down right from the you have your duct your hepatic from the from the uh, liver so you have your cystic duct they both come together and then they form that common bile duct well sometimes those stones can lodge in the common bile duct and what happens is that when it gets stuck what did we say bacteria likes bacteria like stasis anywhere where there's just stasis it causes stasis because the bile is not getting to where it needs to go it's not getting into the intestines so the bile is getting getting backed up you have this inflammation bacteria you have all over your gi system it's going to go there and start causing this inflammation and that's how these patients present they're going to present with their charcoal triad they're going to have fever right because they have this inflammation and inflammation infection going on they're going to have that right upper quadrant pain right upper quadrant pain um they're going to have jaundice right why are they going to have jaundice because you have that stone that's stuck in the common bile duct that is obstructing bile flow from the liver and that's going to cause jaundice okay because the bilirubin has already been conjugated so the liver is working it did its job you know it conjugated it now it needs to get out of the body and go into the stool well it can't get out of there so it's going to go somewhere else and that's why these patients become jaundice it's very commonly found in your woman so that's going to be your chakras triad. Your chakras triad is going to be your triad, three things, fever, right upper quadrant pain, and jaundice. So if you read a question stem, it's a woman, uh, usually it'll be like an you know, obese woman. Um, they're going to be like in their 30s or 40s with the history of kidney stones or they just eat really bad food. And there are jaundice on examination. They have a fever and they have a right upper quadrant pain. You want to think about cholangitis. And then you have your renal pantan. This is going to be a charcoal triad. So the three things that we discussed, your fever, right upper quadrant pain, and jaundice. On top of that, you're going to have septic shock and hypotension. This is severe. I mean, cholangitis is already an emergency. But on top of that, if you have your pentods, Reynolds pentods, this patient is like in shock. So <clears throat> charcoal is, like I said, septic shock and confusion, ultramental status. So once again, Reynolds, Pentaud, Charcot's, plus septic shock, plus confusion, and or alter mental status. And they're going to be hypotensive also. Diagnosis is going to be your ultrasound. It's going to be the initial diagnostic test. Uh, you can also do a cholangiography. This is going to be the gold uh, standard usually for these patients. Treatment, it's going to be emergency treatment. We want to make sure that we do blood cultures, give them IV broad antibiotics like ampicillin, sulfobactin, fluids. Uh, we want to decompress the common bile duct when the patient is stable. We can do this through PTC or ERCP, or we can also do a laparotomy. Complications if cholangitis is not treated is that it can cause a hepatic abscess. This is the most, co most serious complication, and it has a very high uh, morbidity and mortality rate. So once again, cholangitis, you have your charcoal steroida, which is going to be your fever, right upper quadrant pain, and jaundice. You have your Reynolds pantad, which is going to be your chakra triad that we just discussed. Plus, you're going to have uh, septic shock plus uh, confusion or ultramental status. So you're going to have your hypotension, hypotension with these patients. And that is cholangitis. So it's going to acute cholecystitis. This is an inflammation of the gallbladder where the gallstone is lodged in the cystic duct, but it does not, um, sometimes it does not cause infection, but it does induce inflammation. Very commonly found in your Fs, right? Your fat, female, fertile, and 40. This patient's gonna be presenting with right upper quadrant pain or epigastric pain, fever, leukocytosis, nausea and vomiting, anorexia, right upper quadrant tenderness, rebound tenderness. They're gonna have a positive morphine sign. And they're going to have hypoactive bowel sounds. And then on top of that, they're going to have a positive BOA sign, which is pain that radiates to the right shoulder. So it's going to be cholecystitis. So remember we said appendicitis, it's your McBurney's points. Well, for cholecystitis, it's going to be your Murphy's sign, which is going to be right upper quadrant pain upon um, palp deep palpation when the patient <laughs> inspires. So... With these patients, also know the sign, BOA sign, like we said, the pain that radiates to the right shoulder. 
the best initial diagnostic test is going to be your right upper quadrant ultrasound. You're going to see a thickened wall that's distended. You'll see stones there that are going to be present. You'll see pericholecystic cholecystic fluid. And the best diagnosis and the gold standard for these patients is going to be a HIDA scan. So once again, read the question, see what it's asking you. If it asks you what is the best next step, then you can do an ultrasound. If it tells you what's a gold standard, it's going to be a HIDA scan. So treatment for this is going to be admit and supportive care. You're going to give the patient IV fluids, bowel rest, nothing by mouth, IV antibiotics, analgesics, and then a cholecystectomy. So you're going to go in there and cut the uh, gallbladder. So during my, during my surgery rotation, that's all my general surgeon did is cholecystectomies. He just went in there and chopped it off and it was like less than 15 minutes. It's usually laparoscopic, so it's not even invasive. And the patient tends to go home that same day if there's no complications. So make sure you know the differences between a cholecystitis, cholangitis. Also, what is cholelithiasis? So cholelithiasis is going to be a patient that just has gallstones. Their gallstones, sometimes they don't even know they have them. Sometimes they'll have like bouts of like abdominal pain because sometimes the gallstones will move and it will cause that irritation. But I mean, they're fine. Usually these patients uh, don't need to have their gallbladder removed unless you know, it's causing significant pain. But sometimes like if you're doing an ultrasound for something else, you might find them incidentally, but usually there's no treatment required for your uh, cholelithiasis. But cholelithiasis can turn into cholecystitis and cholecystitis can turn into cholangitis, right? So cirrhosis. Cirrhosis is a fibrotic liver cells. What happens is that you have hepatocyte destruction and inflammation. You have chronic scarring and distortion of the liver that's irreversible, and you have hepatocellular failure. The most common cause of cirrhosis is going to be alcoholic liver disease. Other causes is chronic hepatitis B and C. Also, it can be medication-induced, so medications like acetaminophen and methotrexate can cause your cirrhosis. Also, autoimmune hepatitis, biliary cirrhosis, Inherited metabolic diseases like chemochromatosis and Wilson's disease can lead to cirrhosis and then congestive heart failure. How is the patient with cirrhosis going to present? So early on, they may be asymptomatic and sometimes they'll just have, just have nonspecific symptoms like weight loss. The patient can also present with weakness, fatigue, and then you have your late symptoms, which is when the patient starts developing jaundice. So jaundice is that yellow skin, right? Um, sometimes they'll even have icterus. And other symptoms that the patient can present with is pruritus, which is going to be like itchiness. They'll have also hepatic encephalopathy and bruising. If it's chronic cirrhosis, they'll definitely have ascites. They'll have varices. They'll have gynecomastia, testicular atrophy, palmar erythema, spider angiomas, hemorrhoids, and caput medusa. And then symptoms of acute failure of cirrhosis is coagulopathy, jaundice, hypoglycemia, encephalopathy, infection, and elevated LFTs. What's the gold standard for this patient? It's going to be a liver biopsy. And on labs, you're going to see elevated bilirubin and AST and ALT. AST is going to be greater than ALT in alcoholic cirrhosis, so make sure that you know that. Um, you'll see a low albumin, thrombocytopenia, because there's splenic sequestration. So why are you going to see thrombocytopenia? Because the liver is responsible for platelets, right? If the liver is not working, then you're not going to have any platelet production. Treatment, you want to make sure you treat the underlying cause. So abstinence from alcohol, if the patient's taking any new drugs, that is are causing the cirrhosis, then we can just tell them to abstain from taking those drugs, avoid acetaminophen, alcohol, and then the definitive treatment is going to be a new liver, right? So liver transplant for these patients. What are the, some of the complications of cirrhosis that you need to know? So some of the complications is portal hypertension. Portal hypertension is when you have decreased blood flow through the liver. So since the liver is not working anymore, blood flow is not able to go through it, so it causes backup. So with portal hypertension, they're going to be presenting with ascites, peripheral edema, splenomegaly. It's all the backup, right? Because it's not able to go through the liver because the liver is just not working. They'll have gastric or esophageal varices. 
So esophageal varices, like we had discussed earlier, are some of the common causes of your upper GI bleeds, especially if they perforate. Other causes, or how is this patient going to present with hemorrhoids also? Um, bleeding is the most life-threatening complication in your patients with portal hypertension. And diagnosis is usually uh, paracentesis. Treatment's gonna be a TIPS, so it's gonna be a trans transjugular intrahepatic portal systemic shunt that is going to help blood to go through it and not to get past, um, get backed up. So how I think about it is that you have bloods everywhere, you have blood, you have vessels everywhere. So you have a vessel that goes through the liver. If the liver is not working, it's gonna start backing up everywhere. What TIPS does, it just creates like a extra road. We would say like a highway so the blood can keep going through since that liver is all congested and those highways are not working whatsoever. Just go in there and make a new highway. So, um, ascites. Ascites is another complication of cirrhosis. It's accumulation of fluid into the peritoneal cavity due to portal hypertension and hypoalbuminemia. So albuminemia, it's going to be, albumin levels are going to be low. It's the most common complication of cirrhosis. And this patient is going to be presenting with abdominal distension, shifting dullness. So you'll move the patient from one side and the, the dullness will, will move. And you can also see those fluid waves. This patient's also going to be presenting uh, with the fluid waves. Diagnosis, we want to do an abdominal ultrasound, a paracentesis also. It's going to help us measure the uh, serum ascites albumin gradient. Treatment, it's going to be rest, uh, low-sodium diet, diuretics like furosemide, spironolactone, paracentesis, um, TIPS procedure you can also do. And then another complication of cirrhosis is hepatoencephalopathy. This is when their liver, once again, is not working. So what the liver does is that it, it, it detoxifies. It's responsible for detoxification. If the liver is not working, there's going to be less detoxification. So toxins will get in the brain, um, like ammonia, and these patients are going to have more glutamate. Some of the causes are alkalosis, hypokalemia, sedating medications, GI bleeding, systemic infections, hypovolemia, and then due to liver disease for hepatoencephalopathy. This patient is going to be presenting with decreased mental function, confusion, poor concentration, stupor, comma. They're going to have that flapping tremor, that asterixis, rigidity, hyperreflexia also. And diagnosis is going to be a clinical diagnosis. Um, you'll see increased ammonia. And treatment is usually going to be rifaximin. This is, going, this is an antibiotic that's going to kill the bowel. Flora, it decreases ammonia production. You can also give lactulose. And then make sure that you educate the patient on their diet also. Uh, tell them to limit protein. And then we have SBP or spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, which is another complication of cirrhosis. It's portal hypertension that, um, to bowel edema to bacterial migration from the GI tract that can lead to sepsis. The most common bacteria involved is going to be your E. coli. And this patient is going to be presenting with abdominal pain, fever, chills, vomiting, rebound tenderness. They'll have a change in mental status, ascites. Diagnosis is that we want to do a paracentesis of the acetic fluid for white blood cells. Um, and usually you'll see white blood cell counts that are greater than 500 and your PMNs that are going to be greater than 250. Other complications are going to be your varices. This is due to portosystemic shunting where blood is diverted away from the liver due to high pressure. So it chooses a path, the path of least resistance, which causes these varices. Also, hepatorenal failure. This is because there's renal vasoconstriction that causes decreased blood flow to the kidneys and low filtration. You'll have hypoalbuminemia and decreased clotting factors, prolonged PT. And vitamin K is usually not effective in these patients because the liver is not working. So treatment for this is usually fresh frozen plasma. So those are the complications of cirrhosis. So let's go into hepatitis. Uh, this is such. This one honestly is such a huge headache. So let's go through it. So we have different types. You have A, B, C, D, and E. How I memorize it is that hepatitis A and E are the vowels, right? So they hit your bowels, and that's how I memorize it. So hepatitis A, B, C, D, E, they're transmitted fecal-oral route. It hits your bowels. So 
Let's go into hepatitis E. Fecal oral, like we discussed, shellfish. It's found and it's the most common type in U.S. and in children and in patients that had recent travel. So usually with these patients, with these questions, you have a patient that traveled to a third world country and they come back and they're like jaundiced. Diagnosis: You're gonna do a, you're gonna see a positive, um, you're gonna see a positive anti HAV IgM, which is gonna tell you that the patient has an acute infection. If the patient has a positive anti HAV IgM, that means that they had a prior infection or immunization to this. Um, for hepatitis B, let's go into that one. So, uh, sorry guys, anti, it's antibody, so they're going to have a positive antibody to hepatitis A B virus, which is going to be, um, if they have an IgM, it's going to be acute infection of uh, viral hepatitis, and it's usually how you diagnose these patients. Treatment, usually these patients tend to get better in one to two months. Uh, really don't need to do anything for these patients. It tend, like I said, it's a viral infection, so it'll go away. Just make sure that you educate them on the importance of hygiene, washing their hands before they eat. And then routine vaccination of all children is recommended for Hep A at 12 months. So those are the vaccines that we give to our children, right? And then we have hepatitis B. This is transmitted through body fluids, unprotected sex, IV drug use, and also it can be transmitted from mommy to baby, so vertical transmission. And the thing you need to know about hepatitis B is, is, is that it is the only DNA virus. So the rest of them are RNA viruses. Hepatitis B is the only DNA virus. So how are you going to diagnose this? You're going to diagnose this depending on the antigens that they have present. So you have your herp hepatitis B surface antigen, you have your hepatitis B core antigen, and then you have your hepatitis E antigen. If the patient has a hepatitis E antigen, that means that they are very infections, infectious and it also can mean chronicity of hepatitis B. Now, what you want to look for in the window period is going to be your, your um, antibody to hepatitis B core antigen. Okay, And treatment for this is going to be with your hepatitis B vaccine. It's a universal infant vaccination that's given at birth, two months, six months. And if the patient is has been immunized for your hepatitis B, a way that you can find this out is by looking at the serology. They're going to be positive for your antibody hepatitis B surface only. So hepatitis C is going to be the next one. This is going to be a blood burn pathogen that's due, usually commonly transmitted through sexual intercourse and drug use, also needle six. Um, very commonly found in your patients that had blood transfusions before the age of 1992. So that's why we want to make sure that we are screening these patients for your hepatitis C. And also hemodialysis, commonly associated with hemodialysis for hepatitis C, incarceration. Um, the best way to diagnose this is by doing a hepatitis C virus RNA via PCR. And usually treatment for this, there's usually no vaccine for hepatitis C. So if a patient does have hepatitis C, you treat them with sofosfavir. And then also on top of that, you're also going to add in a approved NSSA inhibitors, your like your Vilpatasvir, your Lidipasvir, and then your Declatasvir. Sorry, I hate these antivirals for eight weeks. And then you have a hepatitis D. Hepatitis D needs B in order to cause infection. Hepatitis D cannot infect the patient by itself, so that's what you need to know. Hepatitis B is already bad. But if you get hepatitis B and then on top of that you get hepatitis D, it causes a super infections and it's super, super bad. So once again, hepatitis D needs hepatitis B to cause an infection in a patient. If a patient has infection with hepatitis B and D, it causes a super infection. So hepatitis D requires, like we discussed, hepatitis B virus to replicate. So that's why it cannot cause infection by itself. And some of the etiologies for this is that it presents simultaneously with hepatitis B virus replication or later as a super infection. It's transmitted through bloodborne and body fluids. You can diagnose this by doing an IgM and IgG anti-hepatitis D virus that can be detected depending on the phase of the infection. So hepatitis E, like we said, how do you get this? Usually from travel 
It's going to be your fecal oral, right? Um, very common countries that are associated with, with hepatitis E. It's going to be your India, Asia, Africa, and Central America. And diagnosis, we're going to do an IgM and anti-hepatitis E virus uh, during early um, during early acute infection, you'll see an IgG and anti antibody to hepatitis E virus that's predominant usually after three months if the patient has been infected with hepatitis E. And treatment for this is recombinant genotype one vaccine. Um, that's how usually you can treat this and then prevent this, especially in endemic areas. So how is the patient in general going to present with viral hepatitis? They're going to be having anorexia, nausea and vomiting, fatigue. They're going to be jaundiced. So that's how in your question stem, it's going to say it's going to be jaundice. The way it's going to give it to you and the way you'll be able to find out is it'll tell you whether the patient traveled or not, whether they're sexually active or not, whether they were born before 1992 or not. And you calculate this by sometimes their age, whether the patient has a past medical history of receiving any type of transfusion, et cetera. And if it traveled, right, you want to think about hepatitis A and E, your vowels hit your vowels, right? These are transmitted fecal oral. And like we discussed, A and E require no treatment whatsoever. Usually it's going to get away, go away. Versus your B, C, and D, those are a little bit more severe. So we said that D needs B in order to cause infection because D uses B to cause a viral infection. If you get B and D, it causes a, a super infection in patients. So... This patient's going to be presenting with fever, dark urine. They're going to have clay-colored stools, right? Because the liver is responsible for creating bilirubin that gives your stool that brown color. So if the liver is not working, you're not, be, you're not going to be creating that bilirubin. So your stools are going to be clay-colored. And that's why your urine is going to be a dark urine. The patient's going to be presenting with right over quadrant pain hepatomegaly, splenomegaly, lymphadenopathy. So in these patients, we want to make sure that we're doing a good abdominal examination. With a diagnosis, you are going to diagnose them uh, with your LFTs. They're going to have an increased AST and ALT. They're going to have an increased bilirubin, increased PT. And then you also want to look at their um, globulins. And I'm sorry, for you, you want to check for their PT. It doesn't mean that it's going to be increased. So you're going to look at their prothrombin time and then check their globulins, IgG and IgM. You're going to confirm with serology by looking at the hepatitis B surface antigen, the IgM, like we discussed for your, anti your antibody of hepatitis A virus, and then your IgM for antibody hepatitis B virus and your antibody for hepatitis C virus. So treatment for this is spontaneous recovery usually in these patients. Uh, and supportive treatment is usually the best thing for these patients. You're going to tell them to rest, hydrate themselves, wash their hands, especially for your hepatitis A e and E. Some of the complications of acute viral hepatitis is that it causes fulminate hepatitis, encephalopathy, they'll have GI bleeding, esophageal varices, coagulopathies, and then it can also have aplastic anemia. So let's go into acute pancreatitis. Acute pancreatitis, this is a sudden inflammation of the pancreas where the pancreas is destroying itself by its own enzyme. That's why it's called like auto digestion. There's a really cool picture that I always, uh, that I had Google searched for pancreatitis and it's literally a pancreas that's just eating itself. And it's usually what pancreatitis is. It, the pancreas is auto digesting itself. So what are some of the causes of acute pancreatitis? So I have the mnemonic, I get smashed. So I is going to be idiopathic. G is going to be for gallstones, which is one of the common causes of, and most common causes of pancreatitis. So idiopathic, G for gallstones. And then you have your E for, e for ethanol, T for trauma. And then S is going to be for steroids. M is going to be for mumps. A is going to be for autoimmune disorders, and then S is going to be for your scorpion sting. And then the H is going to be for hypertriglycerides or hypercalcemia. Uh, e is going to be ERCP, so ERCP procedures are very commonly associated with pancreatitis. And D is going to be your drugs like hydrochlorothiazide, pentamidine, Bactrim. These can cause acute pancreatitis. So that's my mnemonic that I memorized. Hopefully it's helpful for you guys. 
So how is this patient going to present? They're going to have severe epigastric pain that radiates to the back. It's worse when the patient lines supine, and it's going to be worse after meals. So they're going to be presenting with nausea and vomiting, anorexia, low-grade fever. They'll have leukocytosis, tachycardia, hypotension, abdominal tenderness, distension. They have decreased or absent bowel sounds, so they'll have ileus. And then you also can have hemorrhagic pancreatitis. So usually with hemorrhagic, you'll have your signs. You'll have your colon sign, which is like umbilical ecchymosis. So you'll see bruising around the umbilicus, your belly button. You'll see your gray Turner sign, which is flank ecchymosis. So you'll see bruising on your flanks. And then you have your Fox sign, which is going to be ecchymosis in the groin region. Diagnosis is usually a clinical diagnosis. We're going to do a CT to confirm the patient has acute pancreatitis. You can also do an ultrasound or an abdominal x-ray. Labs, you're going to see elevated serum amylase. It's the most common, but the most specific is going to be lipase. Make sure you know this. The reason why is that amylase is the most common one to be elevated, but lipase is more specific because amylase is increased in a lot of things. So we think about amylase, it's increased in mumps, right? Mumps can cause orchitis. So that's why amylase is not very specific to causing, to be associated with acute pancreatitis, but lipase is. So diagnosis for these patients, it's usually, uh, like we discussed, um, the clinical diagnosis, we're going to do CT to confirm. And then if we need to do an ERCP, we only do it if we suspect that the patient is having pancreatitis because they have a gallstone that is obstructing. And that's why the uh, pancreas is inflamed. So pancreatitis um, this is the only reason we will do an ERCP if we, if we suspect a gallstone. Treatment is supportive, uh, pain management, bowel rest, IV fluids, electrolytes. We want to make sure that we're monitoring the calcium. And if the patient is having severe acute pancreatitis, then we want to admit these patients to the ICU. Give them early enteral nutrition by, via NG tubes, prophylactic antibiotics because we want to prevent infections because it can, this can cause high morbidity and mortality in these patients. Some of the complications of acute pancreatitis is going to be your pancreatic necrosis, pseudocyst, hemorrhage, ascites or pleural fusion, ascending cholangitis, pancreatic abscess. And then the prognosis is usually done with your Ransom's criteria, which means that it's it predicts how severe um, the pancreatitis is. And usually if they have more than three out of the four that I'm going to discuss in a few minutes, we monitor these patients in the ICU because they are at high risk of pancreatic necrosis. So what's a Ransom's criteria? It's when a patient is older than 55, where blood cell count is greater than 16,000 when you have the patient upon admission, the glucose level is greater than 200, and the LDH is greater than 350, and the AST is greater than 200. 50. So that's going to be your Ransom's criteria. Make sure that you know that. So once again, your acute pancreatitis, the most common causes are going to be your gallstones and then all your, your alcohol abuse for these patients. Make sure that you know that. They're going to be presenting with that epigastric pain. It's severe and it radiates to the back. They're going to be looking very, very ill. Supportive is the best treatment for these patients. Treating their pain putting them by MPO, so nothing by mouth, so bowel rest, giving them a lot of IV fluids, and then the Ransom's criteria, right? If it's more than three out of four, we want to monitor them in the ICU because they have an increased risk of pancreatic necrosis. So hernias, this is also another one that's very highly tested. You have your direct inguinal, your indirect inguinal, your femoral, your spagellian, your incisional and ventral hernia, your umbilical hernia, your obturator hernia, and your epigastric hernia. So we're going to discuss all of them. The common ones that you'll be tested on is going to be your direct inguinal, your indirect inguinal, and your femoral. So make sure that you know these, so pay attention. So direct inguinal is an in, a defect of the transversalis fascia in the Hesselbach's triangle. That's another thing that you need to know is the anatomy. So once again, direct inguinal is going to be a defect of the transversalis fascia in the Hesselbach triangle, very commonly found in your middle aged or elderly patients. So how is this patient going to present? They're, have, they're going to have groin pain. And with these patients, the hernia is 
for the anatomy, it's going to be medial to the inferior epigastric vessels. So how I memorize it on how they present is that D for old dudes. That's how I memorize it. It may or may not work for you. So D, direct, very commonly found in your older patients versus your indirect. This is more commonly found in your younger patients. Um, how I memorize it also in regards to the anatomy, I'm, I memorize it as an MDs don't lie. So <clears throat> MDs don't lie. That's how I memorize it. So MDs don't lie. So medial to inferior epigastric vessels, you have your direct. So MD, medial, right? Direct, lie, L-I-E. So lateral, indirect. And then you have your epigastric uh, uh, vessels. So, so that's how I memorize it. MDs don't lie. Medial, um, medial to inferior epigastric vessels in your direct lie lateral to your inferior epigastric vessels in your indirect. So indirect thinguinal, this is usually due to a persistent processes vaginalis. Usually it can be congenital trauma, and this one's going to descend in the scrotum. So if it does not descend in the scrotum or it doesn't mention the scrotum whatsoever in the question stem, that then it is direct. If it does say that it goes in the scrotum and you're able to palpate in the scrotum, it's going to be indirect. And like we said, this one's more commonly found in your younger patients. And it's going to be where? Lateral to inferior epigastric vessels for the anatomy. And then you have your femoral. This one's very commonly found in women. So out of all of these, the, <clears throat> the most common one is going to be your femoral. Okay. And this one, is most commonly found in women, like I discussed. Uh, usually with these patients, these are at higher risk of incarcerating and strangulation. And the location is usually in the upper thigh and it's medial to the femoral vein. And then you have your spagillion. This is a defect through the spagillion fascia. This one's very rare. It's small, but it has a very high strangulation risk. And it's usually located on the right side and it's lateral to the rectus abdominis. And then you have your incisional or ventral. So it's going to be a patient that had like some type of procedure. And this is due to breakdown of fascial closure from prior surgery. It's going to be at the area of the previous surgery like we discussed. Usually these patients are asymptomatic and they just notice that it increases with size whenever they strain themselves. And then you have your umbilical. This is going to be through the fibromuscular umbilical ring. Uh, usually located in the umbilicus. And it's very commonly found in your babies, your little babies and children. Usually they're benign. You really don't need to do anything unless it persists after five years old. So we'll just make sure that we observe these. And then you have your obturator. This is through a large obturator canal, very commonly found in your females more than males. And it's located in the deep structures and it's not visualized externally. And then you have your epigastrics. This is a, through, this is a defect that goes through the aponeurosis of the rectus sheath. Very commonly found in your middle-aged and young adults. And it's a midline between umbilicus and the xiphoid process. So treatment for this uh, it depends on whether it is reducible, so you're able to push it back, strangulated, or incarcerated. So if it's reducible, we just monitor them. If it's an irreducible hernia, like you can't push it back, cannot push it back. With these patients, we're going to do broad spectrum IV antibiotics and fluids and do emergent herniography. So you're going to go in there and do surgery. If it's strangulated, all right, it's very painful because they have impaired blood flow, ischemia, necrosis. Uh, these patients, once again, are going to need surgery. And if it's incarcerated, like this is very, very severe, uh, usually from adhesions from between hernia sac and intestinal wall, it's going to be firm, painful, non-reducible by direct manual pressure. Once again, these are going to be surgical. So acute GI bleed. So acute GI bleed, make sure that you know this and you know uh, the anatomy and how to differentiate between an upper and lower GI bleed. So let's go into each one. So we have our acute GI bleeds. This can either be visible or occult. Sometimes there's no evidence that the patient is bleeding out. You have to do a, a fecal occult blood test, and that's when you'll be able to see if the patient is having bleeding. And the way you differentiate it is by your anatomy point, the ligament of trite. So the ligament of trite is going to tell you whether the there's an upper GI bleed or a lower GI bleed. So it's going to each one. 
So an upper GI bleed is bleeding above the ligament of trites. Some of the causes of upper GI bleed is peptic ulcer disease, erosive esophagitis, Mallory Weiss tear, esophageal varices, NSAIDs, aspirin, clopidogrel, certain anticoagulants that make patients more prone to bleed. How is a patient going to present with acute GI bleed, especially if it's an upper? They're going to be presenting with hematemesis, so it's going to tell you that the patient has a coffee ground emesis or throw up. They're going to be presenting with melina, which is going to be your black tarry stools. Okay, and if these patients have melina, which is your black tarry stools, it tells you that it's an upper GI bleed. Versus if your stools are like that bright red color, then it's telling you that it's a lower GI bleed because it's going to take time for the blood to go through the system, right? So by the time it goes through already, that's why you have that darker um, brown coffee-like uh, stools. A diagnosis is going to be usually with an upper endoscopy. Treatment for these patients is we usually go in there and do uh, EGD with coagulation of the bleeding vessel. And if the bleeding continues, then we're going to repeat endoscopic treatment or we can do in there, go in there and do surgical intervention like ligation. Lower GI is bleeding below the ligament of trites. Some of the causes of this um, is usually like colorectal cancer. That's usually something that we want to rule out, and it's usually colon ca colorectal cancer until proven otherwise. Other causes, though, can be diverticulosis. So remember, we were discussing diverticulosis. It causes usually painless bleeding, usually in your older patients. Hemorrhoids, NSAIDs, aspirin, clopidogrel, once again, anticoagulants can cause a lower GI bleeding. This patient is going to present with hematoquesia. So their stools it's, are going to be coated with blood. So they'll have fresh, like red, bright blood in the stools. That's going to tell you it's a lower GI bleed. Versus the upper GI bleed, they're going to have like, like this coffee ground, um, They'll have the coffee ground emesis, and then they're going to have, we said, the black tarry stools, right? So treatment for this is that it can stop spontaneously. Usually treatment is supportive. You can also do a colonoscopy. If there's like polyps that are causing the lower GI bleed, we're going to go in there and just remove them. Injection, laser, cautery. And then last resort is just surgical resection of the involved area. So labs for this, we're going to do a stool guaiac for cold blood, CBC, coagulation panel, right? You want to make sure that this patient doesn't have any type of like thrombocytopenia that's causing their bleeds. So we're going to look at their platelet count, PT, PDT, and INR. We want to look at their LFTs, their renal function, so their BUN and creatinine and electrolytes. We want to do an anoscopy or proctosigmoidoscopy because we want to make sure that it's not involved with possibly hemorrhoids. So this is going to exclude any type of anal or rectal source. Uh, we can also do a colonoscopy. This is both diagnostic and therapeutic. And then we can do an arteriography. This is going to locate the area of the bleed. And our last resort is going in there and just opening the patient up. So explorotomy, laparotomy. Treatment for this is usually ABC. So you're making sure that we're monitoring the airway, breathing, circulation, giving them a lot of IV fluids because these patients are going to be volume down transfusion if needed, and then treating whatever is the underlying cause. So next topic is going to be your infectious diarrhea. So infectious diarrhea, make sure that you know this. To be honest with you, I still struggle with these and I always miss questions on them and it's very frustrating. So viral, the most common cause um, of diarrhea, infectious diarrhea, it's going to be your viral causes, most common cause. Usually with viral causes, these patients, it's usually benign. They'll feel better. They really don't need treatment. They just have to make sure that they're drinking all the fluids. So with viral causes of diarrhea, they may or may not present with fever. They're going to be presenting with nausea and vomiting, watery diarrhea, and it tends to last between three to seven days. Sometimes it will not last longer than that. If it does, you want to think about maybe something more severe or more malignant. So what are some of the virus or the common ones that you're going to see? So you have your rotavirus. This one's very commonly seen in your pediatrics, uh, daycare. They're going to be presenting with a yellow-green diarrhea. It tends to last between one to three days, and it's transmitted through the fecal-oral route. These patients can present with nausea or vomiting, and then may or may not present with fever. Treatment for this is supportive. So once again, hydrating the baby, 
giving them back their electrolytes because when they have diarrhea, they become what? They become metabolic acidotic and they're losing a lot of their electrolytes. So no Gatorades, right? No Gatorades. Pedialyte is really good for these patients. No Gatorades. And then we have norovirus. This is a virus that's very commonly found on your cruise ships. And that's usually how it will say on your question stem. Um, 12 to 48 hours. Transmitted fecal aura, oral. They're going to present you with nausea and vomiting, fever. Treatment, once again, is supportive with all these viral causes. And then we go into our bacterial causes. This is the most severe form of diarrhea and pain and fever. So when we think about bacterial, it's more severe. So we have salmonella. This is commonly associated with poultry, pork, and eggs. So it's going to be a patient that tells you that they eat pork or poultry, chicken. It's very commonly associated with blood in your stools. This patient is going to be presenting with fever. We're going to diagnose this by doing a culture and then looking at fecal leukocytes. So you're going to have fecal leukocytosis. Treatment for salmonella is usually supportive. And then we have Chigella. This one's transmitted fecal oral. This patient is going to present with an acute onset of cramps. Tenesmus, which is going to be that rectal heaving, right? And diagnosis for this is going to be with the culture once again. And we're going to see fecal leukocytosis. Treatment for this is going to be with your fluoroquinolones. And then we have staph aureus. Uh, this is usually going to tell you that the patient had an egg salad, a potato salad. They were at a picnic. They're going to have like intense nausea and vomiting. So you want to think when you see a patient that's like just vomiting a lot and nausea, you want to think about staph infection. So these patients will not present with a fever and diagnosis is usually a clinical diagnosis. You can also do a stool sample. And treatment for your staph aureus is usually going to be supportive. Um, so once again, making sure that the patient increases their fluids because they're fluid down, right? Making sure that they're taking their electrolytes. I recommend something like Pedialyte and they have some for adults also. Then we have Campylobacter. So Campylobacter jejuni, very commonly associated with food and animals. I read some questions that even said it's commonly associated with puppies, which I thought was really interesting. Uh, fever, cramps, they're going to they're gonna have um, bloody stools. And another thing you need to know about Campylobacter jejuni is that it's very highly associated with your Guillain-Barre syndrome. So sometimes they'll give you a patient that's presenting with like ascending paralysis. So the paralysis started in their feet and they started going up slowly and they just recovered from some type of like diarrhea a few weeks ago. And you want to think about Campylobacter jejuni. So with Campylobacter jejuni, um, diagnosis, uh, we're going to see fecal leukocytosis and treatment is with azithromycin. And then we have Clostridium. This is usually due to poorly canned foods. This patient is going to be presenting with acute cramping, uh, nausea and vomiting. They will not have a fever and you can diagnose this with a culture. Uh, treatment is supportive for your Clostridium. And then we have E. coli, so just your regular enterobacter E. coli, also known as your traveler's area. It's going to be a patient that just traveled and got back and they're presenting with this watery diarrhea. They're having abdominal cramping. Um, it's transmitted through food and water. Diagnosis is usually with the culture and treatment is with fluoroquinolones. And then we have E. coli 0157.H7. Um, this one is associated with your hemolytic uremic syndrome, thrombocytopenia. This one's severe, okay? These patients can present with fever, bloody diarrhea, and we're going to diagnose this with fecal leukocytosis. Um, that's what you're going to see is fecal leukocytosis if you culture this. And treatment for this is usually supportive. You really don't need to give antibiotics because the antibiotics can actually worsen it. So it's just supportive, giving them IV fluids, pain medication, and making sure that they don't go into shock, right? Or develop hemolytic uremic syndrome. And then we have Clostridium difficile, C. difficile. You are definitely going to see this one. This one's associated with antibiotic use. So it's going to be a patient that just took an antibiotic. And the most common antibiotics that are associated with C. diff is going to be your clindamycin, your fluoroquinolones, penicillin. So it's going to be a patient that just took one of these medications or sometimes it'll just vaguely say that the patient was at a, on a high dose antibiotic for like something really bad, right? They were just came out from the hospital from being in shock or something. And they're presenting with this acute bloody uh, diarrhea. Um, they're going to have fever, toxic cola, and it's just like diarrhea that's just like really, really bad. It's so much. It's coming out of you like water. 
And with these patients, we want to make sure that we are always washing our hands when we deal with these patients because, for example, in my hospital, we have those machines, right? Those like foams that we do every single time we go into the room and every single time we go out of the patient's room. That will not kill the bacteria. It's really important that you go and you wash your hands and you are washing your hands for the long period, not just you put them in the water and you take them out because I will not kill the bacteria. You need to wash your hands and sing your ABCs, right? Until your ABCs are done and then you're good. You cannot just use foam because foam will not, or sanitizer will not kill this bacteria. And treatment for this is usually with uh, metronidazole or vancomycin. So oral vanc or oral metronidazole, not IV, okay? Not IV, oral vanc or oral metronidazole. Uh, now we're staying a little bit more away from oral metronidazole because it's not as effective for this. So usually it's oral vanc, but just make sure that you know it's oral vanc because they'll try to trick you by putting IV vanc on there. And no, it's IV vanc in the hospital. We do it for MERS infections, but definitely not for your um, C. diff. And then you have Vibrio cholera. Uh, these patients are going to be presenting with rice water stools. I'd also, I've also seen it described in questions like, uh, like specks, like sp you'll see specks um, in, the, in the stool. That's how I've seen it described, which I thought was interesting. So sometimes they won't give it to you like rice water stool. Sometimes it'll just say there were specks there. So if it's a specks, then you want to think about Vibrio cholera, rice water stools, commonly associated with shellfish and found in endemic areas, also with dirty water. Diagnosis, we're going to culture this, and treatment's going to be IV fluids, electrolytes, tetracycline, and azithromycin. With Vibrio cholera, it's interesting because there's been outbreaks in the past, and it's really, really scary because this is very deadly. It really, really dehydrates patients, and these patients usually need to be um, given a lot of IV fluids and replacing all their electrolytes because these patients can die from severe dehydration. So let's go into our parasitic causes. So there are numerous parasitic causes, but the ones that you need to know are going to be your entamoeba histolytica. This one's transmitted fecal oral. And just like it says entamoeba histolytica, it's a type of amoeba. Um, this patient is going to be presenting with loose feces, abdominal pain, cramping, fever. Diagnosis is usually going to do your oocytes, right? Your O and P, oocytes and parasites. Treatment is metronidazole. And then you have your Giardia lamia. This one I can guarantee you, you will get a question whether it's on this exam or another exam. You will get a question on this, so you need to know Giardia lamia, also known as your giardiasis. So Giardia lamia, what it's going to say on the question, it'll be a patient that went on a hike and they drank water from a stream, they drank water from a river, and or drank water from a mountain, so somewhere outside where they were hiking. And they all of a sudden present with this like foul smelling, like fatty, bulky stool. And sometimes it'll say fatty stools. And they're very, very smelly. And this patient has lost a lot of weight. So you want to think about Giardia lamia. Diagnosis is culture. And then once again, your o ONP, so oocytes and parasites. And treatment's going to be with metronidazole. So these are going to be your infectious diarrhea types and their treatment and how they're going to present and how they're diagnosed and how. Uh, they are transmitted. So let's go into constipation. Constipation is when a patient has fewer than three stools in a week, hard stools, excessive straining, sense of incomplete evacuation. Normal is more than three stools per week. So at the hospital that we're at, for example, once again, I work with burn patients and a lot of the patients have surgery and burns are just very very painful in general so we give them a lot of pain medications to control their pain because pain uh your burns are painful especially if they have like those partial thickness burns where they haven't burned through their nerves and it's just super super painful for them we give them a lot of pain medications and we every single day that i go in the morning and i round on my patients i always make sure that they have a bowel movement whether they told me that they have a bowel movement or whether it was verified by a nurse or it was documented that they had a bowel movement if they haven't had a bowel movement in the past three days, then that's when I have to intervene and place them on. Um, I mean, these patients are already on laxatives, but I will have to increase their laxatives or possibly consider doing an enema because we want to make sure that these patients do not become constipated. So once again, constipation, it's fewer than three stools in a week. The most common cause is 
usually because the patient is just not eating enough fiber in the diet. Nowadays, we live in a country where most of our diet doesn't include fiber. So we want to make sure that the patient increases their fiber in the diet. They are drinking a lot of fluids, right? And usually these patients also have poor bowel habits. So sometimes they're hold, they have to go to the restroom and they'll hold it and this can cause constipation. Also, things like irritable bowel syndrome, opioids, like we discussed, can cause constipation. And why do we tell these patients to increase their fiber? Why? Because it increases water absorption to the stool and it makes them easier to pass. That's what fiber does. So diagnosis, we're going to do a DRE just to make sure that we don't see anything that can be stuck there, especially in your older patients. Sometimes they can just have like fecal impaction where we have to go in there and remove it manually. And then also a DRE that can stimulate defecation. We're going to do a CBC, electrolytes, calcium, because why calcium? Because remember when we were talking about our hypercalcemia, right? Bones, groans, thrones, psychiatric overtones. So thrones, these patients are constipated. So we want to make sure that these patients are not hypercalcemic. That's why we're going to be checking their calcium. We're going to check their glucose levels, their TSH levels, because we want to make sure that this patient is not hypothyroidism. Do a colonoscopy and a flex sigmoidoscopy just to make sure that the patient has any type of malignancy there that is causing obstruction. Uh, we can do an anal rectal manometry, which is basically a balloon expulsion test. And then treatment, once again, it's going to be their diet, right? Telling them to increase their fiber in their diet, telling them to make sure that they're increasing the fluids, drink a lot, a lot of water. Telling them to exercise. If they spend a lot of time sitting down and not moving, exercise. Get up and move around. And um, treatment for this, if we need to intervene, then that's where we're going to give them our medications like bulking agents. So something like methyl cellulose, pycillium. These are usually good for long-term treatment. They tend to have fewer adverse effects. Another one that you can consider is stool softeners like DocuSate. Usually these patients can get this over the counter. Uh, this helps with water penetration to the stool, and it's very useful in your children. You can also use osmotic laxatives like uh, magnesium sulfate, polyethylene glycol, lactulus. This stimulates the uh, intestinal motility and peristalsis. It cleans the bowels, very commonly used for your colonoscopy. And then we have our stimulant laxatives like bisicodal and senna. This increases intestinal mot motility, and it increases electrolyte and water secretions. So last topic, and we were done. We are done. So we have jaundice. This is typically uh, when you have like the yellowing of the skin, right? It's more, more intense in the upper body and it's less intense in the lower extremity. There's multiple causes of jaundice, which we will discuss. Causes are like chemolytic process where your body's just breaking down a lot of red blood cells that are releasing all this bilirubin that is causing your jaundice, whether it's associated with biliary, right? Because um, remember we discussed about cholangitis can cause jaundice or whether the patient has liver disease like hepatitis. So jaundice, just talking about jaundice, we have bilirubin, right? So bilirubin can be conjugated or unconjugated. Conjugated or direct bilirubin is soluble where it's gone through the liver, it's been conjugated, and it's soluble, so it can be excreted. And then you have your unconjugated, which it has not gone through the liver, and this is usually your indirect bilirubin or your unconjugated and your insoluble, so it cannot be excreted. So with jaundice, another thing that you need to know about is whether, think about is jaundice due to a prehepatic cause? So before it gets to the liver, is there's a problem going on there? Is it due to a hepatic cause and an intrahepatic cause? Is it due to the liver just not working? So things like hepatitis, um, things like cirrhosis, where it's affecting the liver that the liver is not working to conjugate it? Or is it doing is it something that is post-hepatic? So it's past the liver, the liver works fine, but there's some type of obstruction that is causing this jaundice. And the way they're going to differentiate that is by looking at their direct bilirubin and their indirect bilirubin. If it's conjugated, right, that means it's passed through the liver, the liver's working fine, there's just some type of obstruction going on. So um, let's discuss physiological jaundice. So physiological jaundice is usually in days two to seven for like little babies. 
um, and it peaks on day five. This is because there are too many red blood cells in circulation, so the body lyses the extra blood, red blood cells. This releases their bilirubin and it causes physiological jaundice. And then we have hemolytic disease of the newborn. This is where there's production or placental transfer of maternal anti-RH antibodies from an RH negative mommy to an RH positive baby. And then we have kernicterus, which is um, our unconjugated bilirubin that collects in the basal ganglia. It causes brain damage and death. Treatment for this is usually phototherapy. And then there are genetic causes of jaundice. So something like Gilbert syndrome and Krigler-Najjar. So Gilbert syndrome and Krigler-Najjar syndrome increases in unconjugated bilirubin, while Dubin-Johnson syndrome is an increase in conjugated bilirubin. Make sure that you know that's because you're going to have a question. You have a patient that has a genetic disorder like this, and you need to know whether it's conjugated or unconjugated, and if it is, which one is associated with. The mnemonic I have is Gilbert and CN are uncool, right? Because Gilbert and Krigler and Najjar syndrome are unconjugated bilirubin that's increased, but Dubin is contently cool because Dubin Johnson syndrome is increasing conjugated bilirubin. So, once again, Gilbert and CN are uncool, but Dubin is contently cool. Diagnosis is going to be with our LFTs, liver ultrasound, right? Because we want to see whether it's a pre intra or post hepatic cause. We want to look at their both, uh, their total direct and indirect bilirubin. And then of course, making sure that we are treating whatever is the underlying cause. If it's something benign, we're just going to observe it. Sometimes it's going to go away by itself. Okay. All right, guys. So I have finished all of the emergency medicine EOR study guide. Please let me know if I made any mistakes. If you have any type of mnemonics that are helpful for other students, make sure that you comment below. It can help other students and definitely me also since I'm studying for my PENS exam. Also, please let me know if I made any mistakes. I record these usually after working like a 10, 11 hour shift where I wake up like at 4.30 in the a.m. morning. Sometimes I don't get off to like three or four and I get home and I'm tired and I have to study and I think this is the best way for me to study. So sometimes I can be very drowsy and I'll look over some of my notes or miss speak certain things. Please let me know so I can correct that in the comment section and you guys do not make mistakes on your exams because I was sleepy and tired. So please let me know. Um, good luck on your exam. ER definitely was one of the more challenging end of rotation exams for me. But it was my first EOR and I didn't know how to study for it. Uh, after that, I did well in my exams, but this was definitely one of my more challenging ones out of all of them, I think I would have to say. Just make sure that you know your EKGs like we discussed, you know your x-rays, you are definitely going to get a lot of EKGs. You will get chest x-rays also. Make sure that you know your cardio, I got a lot of cardio, I got a lot of musculoskeletal. So make sure that you know your ankle sprains, your tears. Um, your ACLs, your MCLs, how are they going to present, what are the best tests for them, um, your, um, your GI, so your cholecystitis, your cholelithiasis, your cholangitis, make sure that you're able to differentiate between those, your pulmonary embolisms, your pneumonias, definitely, make sure you know your antibiotics, okay, so uh, hopefully this video was helpful for you guys, as always, um, if it was helpful, leave a comment below, I think I still have one more to make from family medicine. I will try to work on them, but sometimes they take me a little long. All right, guys, take care, and I'll talk to you guys later.